Oh, and then I figured out that if I took piss test but ruined the test, they couldn't fucking test me. So I would hide shit in my dick like Drano and, you know, pool cleaner. <laughs> and, you know, I'm uncircumcised. I got that Jew dick, so I would pull the skin back. The chemicals would fall out of my dick into the piss test, and they knew I was breaking the machine. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ari Shafir's Skeptic Tank. I'm Ari Shafir. Um... Today's podcast is about stealing, just so you know. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you about a fucking product that is for online only, so you can't steal. So, yeah, then they go. They go. They're not mutually exclusive. So, uh, first of all, I have Joey Diaz on today, just so you know. This is Ari Shavir's Skeptic Tank. Did I say that? Um, Joey Diaz, our old buddy, is fucking on again, and we're just going to talk about fucking stealing. You guys, the stimulus situation... Is, is the economy, it's just, it's fucking rough. And I know a lot of people are out of work. So what I want you to do is, I want you to start thinking about ways that you can fucking lower costs um, by taking things for free from stores. Um, obviously you gotta have your own code of ethics about it. And all this is just a fucking justification for taking free shit. So, but you gotta think, what can I get away with? And we cover that in today's episode. How do you steal? What were his best methods? It's the E, true Hollywood story of a fucking thief. From the mouths of decadence. Um, yeah, Joey Diaz, we just talked about fucking stealing and shoplifting. Dude, I remember him doing so much shit. Um, and and, and pe people ask me sometimes, like, do you have to steal? And Because I, I do all the time. Joey Diaz doesn't anymore, apparently. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, do you have to? I Meaning financially? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, then why do you? Like, I know rich people, and they ask that, and I'm like, because it's, what do you mean? I don't, maybe I don't understand the question. It's free. Free stuff. Why not? Dude, I was with Mark Norman. Got to watch his new special. Out to lunch on YouTube right now. Also, you got to watch Joey Diaz, Church of What's Happening Now. If you don't know that podcast, it's fucking tremendous. It's all the shit you're going to see here. It's just all that, all the time. Crazy fucking Diaz stories. If you want an episode to start with, Go to Acid Church on YouTube. Fucking, I was on that one. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, I'll put a link. I'll put a box at the end of this on YouTube. I'll put a box, and it'll, like, at the very end, you know, when the two boxes pop up, that'll be one. And Mark Norman's fucking special will be the other one, Out to Lunch. Mark Norman is a legit storytelling, no, joke writing comic. No, he's not a storytelling comic. He's a joke writer. He does good stories, though, but he's a joke writer. But he does good stories. Um, anyway. Oh, to the, whatever. He's on the fucking episode. He'll be on maybe next week or the week after. I'll have him on next week. That's a smart idea. Okay. We're talking about stealing, okay? And I just like it. I just like taking free things. And Diaz used to do it also. I remember we were at the fucking Bob Hope Airport, and he was just like, he went over to one of the kiosks. We can get a sandwich or some fucking corn nuts. What else do you buy corn nuts? What is ginger ale and corn nuts? Why are they airport foods? Maybe corn nuts is more gas station food. Anyway, so he comes back, right? He's like, ah, oh, I see you. He starts flirting. He was like flirting with the fucking kiosk lady, some old like Latino lady. And he's flirting with her in Spanish. He's like, oh. And then he comes back. And he's like, oh, I'll see you later. And then he comes back and he just goes like this, like that, just shines like that. And then keeps walking. I was like, what, what was that? What was that? And he was like, uh, I stole it. Tic Tacs. He stole Tic Tacs. And I'm like, why? He goes, got to stay, stay in shape. <laughs> so, um. So I was like, well, let's have Diaz on to talk about it. Mark Norman actually does steal too. We were at the fucking uh, movie theater and I got some popcorn. And uh, when we got to our seats, he pulled out some beef jerky. And I'm like, where's that from? Beef jerky. You know this is a fucking independent movie theater. Uh, he just got it from the counter. Just snaked it. When? When she turned around to get your stupid order. Should have waited. I didn't outlast him. I made an order. He took the opportunity. He won Best Jew at the fucking local comic fucking award show in New York, the Creakies. Over me. I was legitimately hurt. I was new to the scene. He's not a Jew. Um, okay, so today's episode is all about stealing, right? Um, and it's fucking fun. It's great. And I want you guys, I know a lot of you don't have money because of this. Because it's time, right? Steal. You got to steal. And we give pointers. We let you know how to do it. It's going to make your, the bang for your buck go a lot further. Take things when you have the chance. My code of ethics, I guess, 
Again, just a justification. That's what people do when they're and no, when they know they're doing something wrong. They're like, yeah, I don't care. Um, they just find some reason to latch onto. Is I don't steal from from fucking small owner stores. I don't feel steal from anyone who's gonna feel it. Not that I never did. I have done that. I've stolen from fucking cousins before. But uh, you know, now it's just like a like a Macy's. You know who cares? Old Navy, fucking take it. Who does that come after? Uh, it's split up over fucking three hundred shareholders. 3,000? I don't even know. I have no idea. Or just some rich old man like Mr. Burns just fucking counting his jeans money. Whoa, another stone wash. They don't do that anymore, do they? <laughs> One more rich person who looks like they're poor and I'll have them all. Um, anyway, oh, today's episode, I have a sponsor today. It's Sheath Underwear. So I, he told me I could say this. So this reminds me. Sheath underwear is the kind. And guys, I'm telling you, they're good underwear. You should go to sheath.com, um, uh, promo code Ari. Use my promo code. It'll fucking help me out. The more money I get from these, the less I have to do. But I actually like this. Um, he sent me some underwear. I was ready to laugh at him. You put your, you put your dick into like a hole and your balls sit in a pouch. And I thought they'd be ridiculous. They're so fucking comfortable. Hey, I'm telling you, it feels like nothing, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Sheet.com, promo code Ari. This is what I'm going to talk about. It reminds me of this. Um, I have not gone hiking in these pants. I got to try hiking in them. I assume they'd be good. So this is what it reminds me of. This story is sponsored by Sheet.com. Thank you, retired fucking <laughs> U.S. four-star general or whatever the fuck you are. Probably not that high. Um uh, for sponsoring this story. So there's this chick I wanted to fuck at the comedy store. And she was like, finally, I mean, you know those chicks where you're just like working on it. It's like your fucking Knott's badge from Cub Scouts. Where you're like, I've wanted this thing for a long time. And then you get the chance. And she's like, I'll do it. And you're like, yes. And it was daytime at the comedy store. So we went to the back. Went to the back of the main room. And uh, we're messing around. And you could tell, like, it's going to happen now. You know, glory, glory, hallelujah. It's finally, she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just tell. She's like, we're in, we're, do we're doing it. Okay, great, great. That couldn't make me happier. Some sex? Whew. So we went to the back of the main room. I think that's what it was. I think it was, it was public. It was her going like, fuck yeah, let's do it. As we're messing around, she stops me. It's a key detail in story. Thank you, sheath.com, for sponsoring all of it. She stops me. Use promo code Ari. It says, Ari, later, years from now, there'll be a promo code about you. I can't fuck here because I have molluscum contagium. Pause for a minute if you want and look it up. Um, Becky, if you feel like doing some extra work, put a fucking description of molluscum contagium on the bottom of the screen. If you don't, then I don't know what to tell you. Pause, look it up while you're doing this. Or don't. Uh, it's, it's fucking... It's, it's, it's kind of genital warts, but not exactly. I've had genital warts. I'm, I'm not trying to hide the fact that I've had genital warts. I'm saying this is a separate thing. Okay? I'm like a guy who's... Look, I'll, I'll admit it when I fart. They sucked. And they never tell you with genital warts. They're just like, well, you shouldn't have been fucking around. And you're like, oh, it's the end of my life. They are not kind. AIDS gets all the fucking good treatment. Oh, I need to talk to you. Come in. Do we have counseling? General awards, uh, off to the wind. Good luck thinking you're fucking ruining society. There you go. Know. Try not to kill yourself. I'm not even going to mention that. Oh, you got to tell the fucking chick. Unless she's like, oh, yeah, I've had him for years. You're like, well, ah. Uh. You got to make the phone calls or figure out a reason why you're going to justify not making the phone calls. One or the other. You got to do it. My suggestion, by the way, if you're ever there, just make one phone call and then it'll get easier from there. The second, third, and fourth phone calls are way easier. At that point, you're just like, can we get, hey, how you doing? Yeah, it's nice to talk to you. Anyway, listen, uh, you might have general words. What? What members? I don't know. You got to get tested. There's no reason to go through it. I'm just telling you, you got to go get tested. By the fourth or fifth one, that's all you do. First one, it's like, I don't know how to say this. There's some crying, you're thinking about getting back together. It's horrible. By the fifth, you're great. Hey, you're going to add some bumps. You got Samantha's phone number, that chick we had a threesome with once? 
You know the one where you fucking quit and Samantha kept going like a fucking champion and you did nothing, just sat there. At least play with her boobs. Anyway. What was I going to say? Oh, thank you again. Sheath.com, retired seven-star general uh, in the United States and Canadian and Mexican Army. First time it's ever happened before. Owner of Sheath.com, promo code Ari. So, um, Molesca and Contagion. There we go. There we go. Any contact, skin-to-skin contact, and it's transferred. You get it. Um, that's what she said. So, uh, looking back, and it's true. It's not a general. It's not like a fucking herpes thing or whatever it's called. Uh, uh, HPV. It's like a different one. I don't know. They don't keep coming back like general awards do. Looking back, these might have been general awards. The more I think about it, the more I realize for sure they were general awards. I don't know, unless you found, Becky, unless you found that fucking de- description and it's not general awards, I'm for sure this is a lie I was fed. Regardless, I wanted to fuck. She says, it should go away, it's not permanent, if you should get it, and I was like, all right, I'll take a chance, but I don't want to get it. So she's saying, no, no, if your skin touches my skin there, you will get it. Well, that's where American ingenuity comes in. And that's why we're going to be okay, everybody. Sheet.com, promo code Ari. 20% off your first order. Oh, I never mentioned that at all. You get 20% off your first order. Not only do you support, 20% off your first order. Promo code Ari. Oh, what if somebody ordered already? Then I don't get it. That's what's wrong with America. Look how quickly I turn. So anyway, I'm like, I want to fuck. And this is why Sheet.com reminded me of this. Well, uh, how can we have no skin-to-skin contact? You know that hole in your underwear where you pulled your dick out when you were younger where you didn't want to expose your fucking tiny little fucking pebble balls at the urinal and you're so embarrassed and you got to make your pee last longer because that's how fucked up dudes are? If my pee didn't last longer than that dude or that dude, they'd be like, what the fuck? I was already paying when you got here and I'm still paying when you left? You fucking half a man. That's what we fucking think, legitimately. Again, maybe just me. Um, anyway, so you pull your, your dick out of your pants, right? Your underwear. And then maybe straight out of the zipper. That's why dudes don't get corona as much. Because there's no, you know, you don't have to fucking, t- or what, don't we get as much? AIDS. We might get it way more. So I was like, all right, I'll pull the dick out of my, of my underwear. So there's no, let me get you in here. Watch me here. By the way, you can watch us on youtube.com slash skeptic tank. New video episode up every week. Old episodes going up soon. We're going to do them like two at a time. Two a week of like the old ones, and we'll put them up here. It'll be audio only, but it'll be added to the fucking, so they'll all be up here. YouTube.com slash skeptic tank. Oh, maybe I'll get Red Band to give me the fucking original ones, the first 21. Back to the story. So anyway, imagine dick out here, right? So all this region, but if you're listening on the radio or whatever, on iTunes, that's still fine. I'll still work for you. You get the songs. They don't get the songs. Is that me coming? Where the next two? So, uh. This whole region is like no skin to skin contact right on the fucking, you know, leg and, and like l- super lower chest, upper, upper waft, you know, no skin to skin, but the fucking peen, you know, that's going to come in contact. So condom, condom, dick through, underwear blocking. There's no open, just like a sheath.com underwear. Me with that condom. The sheet.com does not look like a long thing coming out, by the way. It doesn't look like your dick is fucking, like, it's, it's like a, it looks like regular underwear. Accentuates a, patch, a pouch a little, but it's not like, you don't see like a snake. But anyway, that was like, a, it could have been a prototype. Your dick coming out, balls in the underwear, dick in through the hole into a condom. No skin to skin contact, did not get genital warts. Or, or Molescum Contagium. Thank you, Sheets.com. Promo code Ari for 20% off your first order. They are comfortable. So today's episode is all about stealing. And, uh, and I guess there's no way to steal those sheets, huh? Well, you got lucky. You made it a fucking online thing. Don't forget to check out. And check out Mark Norman's special, by the way. Out to lunch. Sorry. I'm fucking out of it right now. Out to lunch. Guys, let's start the episode. Thank you, Sheet.com, for fucking sponsoring that fucking coming 
through a pulled out dick in your underwear with a condom on story. It's highbrow. Um, yeah, let's start. Episode 386. From the mouths of decadence. You know, Shroom Fest is coming, by the way. Only holiday that's not getting canceled. Only festival that's not getting canceled. July 4th, 5th, and 6th. Go to your local... Uh, well, I'll say in the outro. Get get shrooms. You celebrate where you are. Um, all right, that's it. You guys, uh, if you want to go to patreon.com slash skeptic tank, I do uh, a couple entries a week lately. A travel story. Last one was about going to the pyramids in Egypt and fucking... It was fun. It was a good time. Anyway, travel story and then a fucking mailbag question, which fucking was a great one this week. To the week before. Anyway, whatever. Patreon.com slash Skeptic Tank. Hook it up over there. Go over there. Seriously, support me, and then I'll give you content, and then I, you know. Let's start the episode. Ari Shavir Skeptic Tank. Episode 386. The Revenge Robber with Joey Diaz starts new. What about that fucking Momo yesterday who got hit by a jet in Austin? What the fuck? That's the last what? guy I'd take to the track. What? This motherfucker was walking on the fucking Austin jetway, you know, confused. Everybody else was locked up. He goes, let me see if I can jump the fence at the airport and take a walk. Well, a Southwest flight took him out like a fucking... He got chopped up. He's done. They're finding his ear was in fucking Tucson. No fucking way. Yeah, he got hit by a fucking jet, poor bastard. Mental oh health, my God. it's a motherfucker. Well, I, I mean, they have fences for a reason. You know, I don't want anybody to die, but they got fences for a reason. You know those things where it's like every year, somebody on one of those roller coasters will jump over the fence to get the change dropped out of their pockets, and they get hit by someone's foot going 90 miles an hour, die, and the guy's foot falls off too. I don't like fences. Fences were always a big deterrent for me. I would have never made it in the Olympics. In 1983, because of the hurdles, the hurdles you would have been like, nah. I'm out. I only hurdled the fence <laughs> one time, but climbing them, that's where I got an F minus. Like climbing a fence, I go like halfway. Once I had to, got to the top, I always was a pussy to put my leg over. But one time I robbed this bookie, and he had dogs, and they chased me. And when I hit the fence, I had a high hurdle it, but it had bob wire. And my hand got caught in the bob wire with a glove on. I had gloves on. And yeah. it twisted my inside right here. I still got a V on my hand. That's what you get. That's karma from stealing when you have a scar on your hand. That's how Miss Pat got caught. She was climbing a fence. She got shot in the tit when she was yeah. climbing, a, like, climbing a fucking chain link fence. So the fu I, I, I went to the bar like Michael Jackson. I kept the glove on all night, bleeding with the glove. People like, what's up with the glove? I'm like, mind your business. Where's the blow? <laughs> so I didn't go to the hospital till the next day. It was too late to stitch it up. And Ari, where you moving to? You give me anxiety here. Oh my god! Stop with the fucking moving. Relax. <laughs> my dog goes crazy. She's having anxiety. separation anxiety. I can't even fucking close the door. She goes fucking nuts. You're too much of a mama's boy. What are you gonna do? Oh, dude, I'm so jealous of what you're doing right now. Why are you jealous? Because I can't have that the fucking flower like that. I mean, I have oh, a little bit. Is, I, I just went, got my pack. I, I went, I can't I went do that last shit night. I went last night at about six fifty-five. I went. And I picked up some of this and these THC pills they got just to switch it up. They're yeah. called Ultra. I don't even know how many milligrams they are. I just eat the whole pack. There's like 10 of them in there. Pills? Yeah. I fucking Calories in that or no? Calories, one point. Dude, I remember, I remember uh, one time at the improv. I think it might have been a New Year's with me, you, and Rogan. And you, would, you go to the crowd. You go to like, uh, you know, I stopped smoking pot. And, and you're known as a fucking pothead, you know? So then the crowd was just like, what? No. People were yelling like, no. And you were like, what? They're like, well, how could you? And he goes, oh, no, 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 I, I still vape and do edibles. I'm just not smoking for a while. <laughs> and people are like, oh, all right. That's yeah, fine. Nah, listen, I'm always going to smoke. I, uh, it's part of who I am. It's 12 years old. It's the last thing That's I have. you started 12? Yeah. It's the Damn. last thing I have from my past that I hold on to. Like some people hold on to teddy bears. Some people have their graduation picture up on their wall to remind yeah. them. Marijuana reminds me that at one time I wasn't the best person in the world. And, you know, it's it's amazing how I uh, use it. I use it. It's changed my life. I don't know. I just like to get ripped. I'm very happy that I found marijuana at an early age. 
because I should have been diagnosed with all those things. Oh, and you mean the, use it like unintentionally for the medicine part? Yeah, I didn't know nothing about it. What I was doing, you know, when I would get high, I would take my mind off my mother's death. It would take off the shitty situation I was in, and it just gave me peace. I would always sleep at night. I I couldn't sleep without marijuana, but then I got a cold awakening. I got locked up, and there's no marijuana in prison. So for a year, I had to go without smoking. So that really adjusted. It gave me a break from it. I had been smoking since I was 12. Now I'm 25 years old with no fucking reefer. Hey, what drugs got allowed into prison? Like, what could you get while you're in prison? Everything. But but not smokables? I mean, you could smoke, you could smoke. cigarettes, I guess. But the problem was, where I was, it was a country club. So in my mind, even at 25, as you naive, I wasn't naive. I was uh, careless. Yeah. They tested you once a week randomly like when you went to breakfast they go Ari Diaz and Lee Syatt go That's see the doctor me. yeah and you'd go and piss but the only test they couldn't test you for was acid so the librarian was a little Jew nerd dude with glasses right out of a movie if you could describe a Jew smart guy everybody else read you know fucking people yeah. magazine he was on page 84 of the New York Times every day. Didn't say much. He was in there for double murder. He murdered his wife and the mailman. That's why it became a federal charge. You can't kill a mailman. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, because uh, they work for the government. Anybody who works for the government, they want to protect them. It's the king's men. We became friendly. He got a connection to acid. So me, him, and the guy that was responsible for distributing cocaine from L.A., to Denver and like Wyoming from the Crips. He was a black kid, Torrey Piles. He was my goomba. He was like you and me in jail together. Wow. He had seven girlfriends. He was legitimately a millionaire. When everybody else was talking shit, I got bitches and all this shit. He had seven different women driving seven exotic cars that he had bought them, and he had kids with all of them. And he'd schedule them at different meetings. They all knew it by <sighs> each other. It was something out of a fucking movie. But me and him made dear friends. And we used to do acid and trip out and eat nut butters at night the whole time. Dude, wait. Acid is a fucking 12-hour trip. You, you're doing that in prison? We would start at 8 o'clock in the morning and go that back to our barracks at 6. I can't think of a worse place to do acid than fucking, I mean, mental space-wise. But we were outside. We were outside. There was, in front of army barracks, there was uh, benches that you could sit on. So all of us would get together lightly because if a CO sees three or more people hanging out together, yeah. sure enough, the next morning you're going to get piss tested. But they could piss test us all I want. They couldn't find the acid. So acid became the big thing in there. Like we ate acid for New Year's, Christmas, you know. That's still the thing that people ask. Like, well, you know, I'm gonna get tested for for drugs. Like, that they have a test for mushrooms, but it's so expensive, and they catch so few people that it's like nobody does it. People have no idea the expense of urine tests. So when the court will say to you, "I'm putting you on a court ordered test," when you go to pee, yeah. look at the boxes they check. I think now they use hair. If they use a general, yeah. that means they're testing for the top weeds, like weed, cocaine, amphetamines, but they're not really using for opiates. They're not. There's a lot of shit that gets through those tests. So whenever they would test me, I would look at the box they were checking. They can't check you for the high-quality test every time. That would kill the state. Yeah. So sometimes they just test you for marijuana and... And I cool. test positive for poppy seeds because I'm a poppy seed bagel addict at the time. Dude, that's Boulder. legit. That's legit. That, that's legit. That will test your positive yeah, that for will heroin. Test your positive. For heroin if you just eat a poppy seed bagel yeah. every day. At that time in 77, 87, 88, the test was still picking up weird things. If you drank a lot of water before a test, they would make you retest. They knew that the test you gave them had too much water in it. Because you know you're trying to like so clear, you, to cover yeah, up. Yeah, because the phone, you would have to call in at 10 to get the number, the color yeah. of the day. 
the color of the day is aqua black and green. If you're one of those colors, you have till 6 o'clock to flush. So if you smoke the joint Friday night, right from there, you go to a park and start doing jumping jacks. You sweat and sweat and sweat and sweat and sweat, and then you drink v- vinegar. That white, clears it? White vinegar. No, I, I did cocaine. I drank 10 gallons of vinegar. I still came up positive. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love how the fucking prison system all it teaches you to do is not to not do crimes, but how to cover up your crimes better. Oh, uh, and then I figured out that if I took piss tests but ruined the test, they couldn't fucking test me. So I would hide shit in my dick like Drano and you know, pool cleaner. <laughs> and you know, I'm uncircumcised. I got that Jew dick, so I would pull the skin back. The chemicals would fall out of my dick into the piss test, and they knew I was breaking the machine. It is, my life is a fucking joke. I always figured it out. And then when I got separated, my wife made them test me for drugs, but she had to pay for them. She didn't know that she was paying for the cheap test. She was paying for, like, the weed alcohol test. So I kept doing coke like a motherfucker, and I kept going to court, and they were like, his... His sample urines are uh, clean. It really is. Now I think they get you with the hair. Yeah, the hair maybe is more. I don't really know enough about it. I just feel bad for people when they're like, can't smoke weed because I work for the government or I can't smoke weed because I'm in the army. And it's like, what? The army won't always kill me because the army is like, wait, every Vietnam movie I ever saw, all they were doing was smoking weed all day, every day. And shooting heroin. Yeah, so it's like they test you in the army now. Well, why the fuck would you do it? Well, I don't know. What is that? She had, somebody, she had an interesting... somebody broke somebody somebody broke fucking quarantine. Arresting yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is today. Uh, today is the day when we open up retail shops, toy stores, bookstores, sporting goods stores. Okay, they're opening them up. Yeah, they're opening them up. Yeah, whatever, man. And uh, last night, I went out for a ride to the weed store. I got my little pills. Yeah. I went to the car, and I went for a ride. And when I made a right by NoHo Park, yeah. you thought there was a fucking parade. Now, I used really? To... People were celebrating? No, no. They're not celebrating shit. People were out by the droves. Social distancing was nowhere to be su- seen. So my uh, plan was to pull into the YMCA and get out of the car, walk around the YMCA parking lot and fucking uh, talk on the phone, make some late night calls to some people to check in. I couldn't make a fucking turn in there. Do you know why? Some big black dude had a class going on with like 30 women doing yoga, all of them two feet apart. I could not, nobody had a mask on. And then, here's the best one. You're not going to believe this one. Yeah. I get onto fucking Magnolia, and I make a right on Lancashire to take the long way home, and Dean Delray calls me. So I promised my friend Brett that I would keep my eyes on his store. He's out of town. So when Brett called me, I didn't want to talk to him on the phone and get a ticket, so I made a U-turn, and I parked in front of my friend's business. I'm sitting there 10 minutes talking to Dean about generalities, movies, what are we going to do? He's thinking of maybe moving apartments to save rent. Yeah, you're I see a cheap girl rents. walking towards me, guys. That's a fucking 12. Stripper heels, hot pants, cut off t shirt, fake tits, nipples are on fire. Yeah, this is LA, but this is LA. Lancashire Boulevard. Down the block from the old ha ha. Well, that's where the porno stars live, right? Up, uh, so up by there. So she stopped. She walked. I'm like, Dean, I think this is a hooker. And sure enough, where I was sitting, she stopped, looked at her phone, looked at me, like for me to give her the notice. And then she kept walking. Hotter than fuck. Asian girl. Not five minutes later, I'm looking at the Greek place. Yeah. And I see a white chick with a mini skirt, big titties, no bra. On, walking across the street like she's waiting for fucking the bluebird of happiness. <sighs> I say, you know what? This is fucking crazy at the massage places. 
of making the girls go out to suck dick on Lancashire. So now I get the Lancashire and Magnolia, and I hit the left, and there's a Starbucks stand, there's a, t- a Tennessee chicken place where they all go to pick up chicken and they stand out line like a bunch of zombos giving COVID to each other for a fucking dead chicken that's got beat up and been abused. And I see another Asian hooker walking towards me. And I make the left and I go, oh my God, they are fucking, this town, this is not Hollywood. This isn't Hollywood or Vine and Sunset. This is fucking uh, North she, Hollywood families. That, that's where fucking, yeah, that's where that's where Miyagi and fucking Danielson lived. It was North Hollywood. But uh, I was thinking about what you asked me I about mean, last night. Yeah, shoplifting, stealing. And it was really crazy. I was raised against the whole concept because of religion. So Catholicism. when were you against stealing? I was against stealing until about the age of seven. Oh, okay. I knew right. that it was very bad in my <laughs> house. Right. My mother had money in the house. My mother always told me, if you need something, ask me and I'll give it to you. Okay? Yeah. And then... When I started hanging out, Ari, sit down. You're giving me agita, you fuck. Jesus Christ, you keep moving around. You're making me it's nervous. This fucking you know, dog like keeps moving. whining. Well, put him outside where he belongs. That's what I'm doing. I put Take him, him to the restaurant. You got a small $22 from today. He's one serving of fucking <laughs> Kung Pao chicken. General spot. <laughs> so, Wait, so at what point like do, when did you first start like so hey, then you know when what, I went to 148th from- street in Harlem they used to like steal tomatoes from vendors and an apple yeah. and I started doing that and one day like I stole an apple and the guy told my Santeria godmother and that was a complete no no in her world she started she took me in the house and started throwing fucking verses at me about being a Catholic and how it's wrong so I, I got when she spoke to me about that shit I kind of paid attention. So then I was good about it. And then when I moved to Jersey, that neighborhood was based on stealing. Yeah. So the first hobby I got involved in was how to steal motorcycles from trains. Three o'clock, a bunch of kids would go down to Sea Caucus, walk two miles. Lee, what we would walk would kill you. Just to, And then we'd wait for the Erie Lackawanna to drive by on one of those trains, and we had a guy that would jump break the seal, open the door, and throw the motorcycles out. Wait, 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 wait. And this is went, just, this is crazy shit. This is... You went from stealing my, nothing to stealing a full motorcycle? Six of us. I was part of a clique. I was a spick. I, w- I was odd man out. I had to prove my valiance one way or another. If I said, no, I wasn't going to be with you guys, I was going to be called the half a fag spick. And if I did go, I could prove. But spick who, either way. <laughs> yeah, either way, you're still a spick at the end of the day when you look in the mirror. But I didn't want them to think I was soft. I was 148th Street trained. I already knew about the things of life. I had already got beat up, so I agreed to go down there with them, and it was fun. We would, you know, each of us got a motorcycle eventually. The, the trains up, are moving. Yeah, but they're doing like 10 miles an hour. Okay. And there'd be cops driving upon those paths to check on those trains. We'd have a guy looking. And there was a, the cop shot me one time with a salt and pepper gun. They would explode and you'd get itchy for three days. You would just scratch. I still have the <laughs> bruise on my side. It's just a little marking where it hit me. And then I had to run home sweaty with salt all over me. It's like what they did to <laughs> Jesus type shit, throwing salt <laughs> on him when he's down. You got to tell your mom too. She's like, what happened to you? You're like, I don't know. Oh, I, I just ran in the, door in the house and she knew. But I ended up with a Honda 50 bike. And then there was a kid next door that if you brought him hot bicycles, he'd fix them. So it was more ingrained in the culture of the neighborhood. You know, robbing a bike from a neighborhood over, mm-hmm. of a neighborhood who's got money, doesn't make you feel bad, you know. I don't mind uh, taking bread from the mouth of decadence. You know what I'm saying? I uh-huh. mean, 
fuck you. The you got more money than me. Yeah. yeah, you got more money than me, and you, I wouldn't leave my bike on the street, but because you don't value the do- value of your father's dollar, you leave your bike on the street. Then there's motherfuckers like me that walk by and see your little bicycle on the street with no chain on. I know I got cardio. Yeah. I, at 9 and 10, I had cardio for days. So I would jump on a bike, bring it to my friend's house, and within three days I had a new bike. We'd sell the bike and split the profits. Would you do anything? Would you have any sort of like code of ethics for you guys to like not in my own neighborhood? Yeah, not in our own neighborhood because people would know eventually. And then you had to fucking have arguments. So if we lived on 38th Street and yeah. you lived on f- from 43rd up, you were free game. You could leave your bike out there for a minute. I still remember my friends robbing a Chinese delivery guy. He dropped food <laughs> off. They went in the what? car. We delivered the food. We split 60 apiece, and we just dropped the car off with, like, three deliveries. Cops were looking. <laughs> you couldn't just leave your shit the way you do now and go upstairs and visit your friend and leave your ignition in the car. Even as a joke, we'll take your car and drive it to the city and park. Just it like there. walking by, I'm like, nah, fuck it, may as well. Yeah, might as well take it. Like that's what you get for being stupid. Dude, I saw I saw a guy in the East Village. He's like, this dude went into a bodega, got off his bike, a delivery kind of guy, got off his bike, like kind of looked, then went to his bodega. Some other guy jumped on it and just like quickly looked, and and I and I felt like saying like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? But I fucking pussed out. I didn't say a word. The guy drove off. The delivery guy came out. I was like, what the fuck? But then the guy came back. He was like, ah, I'm, I'm, he was his buddy. Just fuck with him. But I was like, fuck, I was a coward. Should have said something at least. So from there, yeah, stealing didn't become an issue for me. Like it just went against my Catholic views. It went against who I was and stuff. But then something happened. I saw something and read something and I confronted my mother about it. And she gave me some story. But that, yeah, like, so like, what? I, I've always said to people that, like, I don't have alcohol in my house, and I don't want Mercy going in my back bathroom. I used to go in the back bathroom and leave the bong on and weed. Now, I go to back there, I clean it, I smoke it, and I put everything under the sink. I don't want her to know I get high, and there's a reason, How because can... you don't want your hero. You don't want to know what your heroes do. How are you going to keep that from her? When she's, she's 14, way. she'll find out, but for okay, right now, she'll be fine. She's a seven-year-old little girl. She can't wrap her heads around that right that's now. True. When that's she true. sees people smoking on the street, she looks at me and she goes, look at that guy ruining the earth, Dad. <laughs> so she looks at it from that perspective. So I uh, didn't, wasn't, it wasn't going to be in my life stealing. Like, it just, I don't mind doing a lot of other things, but stealing is the culture in New Jersey. So when we were 15, we saw a van one day that had T-shirts and it had, like, presses for T-shirts. And, and we looked at it for about two days and we're like, this van hasn't moved. What do you think? <coughs> so we said, fuck it, let's break it. And we broke it and we took things every night until we just said, let's take the van. We took the van, we unloaded it, and then we would go to New York City to comedy book conventions and Let- sell all the T-shirts and shit. Oh, you couldn't leave well enough alone just taking stuff out? You were like, f- f- let's take more? Let's just yeah, take let's the whole take van? We, we emptied the van. Wow. Three, three or four kids' garages, and then that Saturday we paid somebody from the neighborhood who had a car to drive us into the city to wherever the convention center was, Martin Madison Square Garden, you know, and there would be, like, comic book conventions, and there would be, like, just places that would buy that shit. But it's like you know. the weird th- it, people don't understand. Like if you tell somebody now, like you, you stole or whatever, they don't get it, and I, and I don't understand what they don't get. It's it's free stuff. As long as you don't think about the person you're stealing from, it's just free shit. It's it's here's let me show you the big difference. I come from a neighborhood where there was a guy in my neighborhood that every time you went to his house, I loved him. Yeah. Let's just say, for example, his name is Ari Shafir. Okay. Every time I call for that. Ari, every time I call for Ari, didn't take a genius that Ari's father wasn't like the other fathers in the neighborhood. He would invite you in. You want a beer? Have a beer. And you're like, 
and the mother would come out. You can't give him a beer. Mind your business, Lorraine. <laughs> the kid wants a beer, give him a beer. And you drink a beer, and after about five minutes, he'd like, be like, what size shoes are you? And you're like, what are you talking about? And he'd get up, go to a closet filled with fucking shoes, take a box out, put the shoes on, and go, look at you, you're like a movie star. Next time you see me, give me $8. There were great deals because he was he, he was an associated mafia guy, and he would always have shit. His garage had so much shit in it that he couldn't even close it. Like so, I'd be over there placing the bet, and I'd win, and he'd look at me and go, "What size jacket are you?" <laughs> Forty. I I got something for you. And he'd open up shit, would knock him over, and he'd give me a leather jacket. Look at you. It's Not all for, stolen shit. All stolen shit. So wow. when you grow up in that type of society, you know, my mother, when I lived, when we had the bookmaking operation in Harlem, every day a junkie will show up with four lobster tails, <laughs> with fucking like a, a, a stitches, like bleeding from his neck, because he robbed it from the sea market in the Marquetta on the east side under the trains. There's those little supermarkets. I don't think they exist anymore. But know. in the 70s, the, there's even a shot of one, if you watch Carlito's Way, when he meets the guy from the, uh, when they cut his arm off in Scarface, and you hear the train running and people walking around, those were called mar marquetas in like the, on the Spanish side of Spanish Harlem. Okay. So, what were we talking about? So the oh, junkies yeah. are bringing lobster. So it was. <laughs> so you got Lee to keep you on track. It was <laughs> something. That's great. It was something that the neighborhood expected. You expected people to knock on your door every day and go, "Hey Ari, how you doing? Ari, listen, I got a pound of weed. I stole it from Ray Rogan. If you don't say nothing, I don't say nothing. It's worth eighteen hundred. I'll give it to you for six. I'll take that weed and sell in Arizona. Rogan will never know. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, or use it, you know? Yeah. People, or it's like would, people would always come to you with deals. It's called, it fell off a truck. Were they legitimately, oh yeah, I mean, that's an old like, okay. movie term, right? Fell off a truck. They, legitimately though, would they, would they even say it was stolen or would it just be assumed? And like, why even bring this up? Listen, it's like, I got I look, a deal for you. When I look at you and I go, you need a TV? And you're like, yeah, what are you looking for? Sony Trinitron. I got them in a box. How many you got? Three of them. Give me three of them. It's assumed it's that you are not going to send the warranty in. I know you're not that <laughs> fucking stupid. Okay, that's number one. There's no warranty. You just got to keep... Because I would sell... If I had something, I would go to a catalog and go, I got that air conditioner in there for three ninety nine. That's yeah. four plus tax. Give me two and a quarter. And then you would say two done cash right now right so i'm saving you 50 percent off the barrel please do not return that air conditioner like a jerk off and say you want another one because you're gonna get me in trouble please don't send in the fucking warranty and please <laughs> use it until it blows up do yeah. not fucking get it fixed because it's stolen there so must this be is, idiots yeah. this is how i lived my life back then I don't know how many times I went into a place, but I never really stole from anybody. Like shoplifting, I was so turned off to it. Wait, but what do you mean? You didn't like shoplifting? What do you mean you didn't steal from anybody? I, I got caught shoplifting at an early age, and I didn't do that anymore. That was independent. That's my decision. But if Ari and Duncan saw a van parking yeah. around the corner from Comedy World. Yeah. We assumed Superman 1 was in that motherfucker and we were going to pick up $2 million. I'd uh -huh. take a walk over there with Ari and Duncan. I got nothing to lose. I'm a good lookout. Ari says he knows how to bust the window. Let's go. I'm a lookout, Jack. Yeah. So this, that, that called felony favors. But my thieving days as a personal thief, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But... Yeah. I became something. I, I realized that when I got angry at you, if I couldn't beat you up, that was the only way I could get back at you. It was from stealing something from you. And I would torture you. Like, I would steal it and put it somewhere else first. 
So with my godfather, I would, I knew he had ten thousand dollars stashed somewhere. I would take the ten thousand dollars where he had it hidden, and uh-huh. I'd put it in the suit jacket. And I'd watch him go crazy for two days looking for but this it's not, money. But it's not gone yet. No, I haven't stolen it. Right. And then three days later, he would find it in the suit jacket. He wouldn't say nothing to my mother, and he wouldn't say nothing to me, but I knew I had him. Well, I knew I had him. I fucked with him. Right. In his mind, he really thought he put it under. Then I found out he used to sleep with his money under his pillow. He was so cheap. He would put like 10000 under his pillow. So I would do creepy things downstairs. Like there's a fire in the kitchen. And he would get up. And then I'd run upstairs through the back way and take a hundred off the thing. It was just hysterical. And I would just drive him crazy. I, I kept moving his money around. I moved his money around till fucking my, my mom finally threw him out. Like, we tormented him. Why, because he thought he was going crazy? He thought he was going crazy. He Dude, couldn't, I he, love when you fuck with people. He I'm was not so say good who, with num- He was so accurate with numbers. Yeah. So then what he did was he put the rubber band on it a little different. I figured that out. He put the rubber band. He put a marking on the top bill so you couldn't take the top bill. So I would take a bill from the inside. Everything he threw at me, I fucked him up. He would put a hair on the door and put tape on it to see if you broke into the door. Yeah. I figured out how to fucking move it, and he'd think it was the same spot. He would put a pencil <laughs> mark. You know, listen, I battled the guy for years until I cracked him, and then one day something that I discovered gave me the okay to do what I was about to do. And I used his attorney because he was a bookmaker. I like used your mom? I you for what? Like your mom? Like my mom. He had his own bank. That's yeah. why there was already a wedge in the house. Because my mom could my stepdad could have joined forces with my mom. Instead he joined forces with this Cuban guy. That my mom had no uh feelings about either yeah. way. But now that my stepdad had gone over with him, it affected her a little bit. But she would break his balls. So for breakfast, me and my mom would sing him songs. You know, where are you going today? West New York? And we would sing, La Vandera, West New York, West New York. And he, and he would go, fuck his boat. And he would leave. And then I'd steal 100 from him. You know what I'm saying? Like I would get him. And then he found out money was missing. So he would hide it, and as soon as he'd hide it, I'd find out where it is. And my most famous one was the week Elvis died. He came home in the afternoon, and that Monday morning, Superstar Basketball Camp was starting in Jersey City. Now, for people who don't know what Superstar Basketball what Camp is, is yeah. it's run by Coach Hurley. Coach ba- Hurley from St. Anthony's. Father? Fa- Bobby Hurley's father Whoa, and his cool. other brother. And I remember the Danny year Hurley. I went was in 77, and they were babies. They were three and two. While we were doing summer camp, they were on the side, the Hurley kids, playing bad. I used to talk to Mr. Because Mr. Hurley wanted me, Whitey O'Donnell, and this other kid to go to St. Anthony's for basketball. Wow. Dude, I remember a story of him at Duke, and there was some guy, I think on NC State maybe, and he, he Bobby Hurley's guarding him pretty good. And then about five minutes into the second half, the dude, he, he had like three points up until then. He had like 22 points by the end. And uh, the reporters asked him afterwards, MVP, got the game. And they're like, what happened? How did you like start going off? And he goes, well, I just looked at who was guarding me. And I suddenly realized, like, this white guy's not going to guard me. <laughs> and then he just fucking took control. <laughs> did you do shoplifting, though? Like stores where you go in and be like, let me take an apple. Let me take a fucking, In the you know, eighth grade, there was a fucking shop right behind the grammar school. And we okay. became the, they had tr- top-notch security. You were working against top not Steve's, myself, Orlando Salcedo. There was like six years that would confuse you. <laughs> we knew the system. We had a kid we called the Russian. He wasn't Russian. He was really Cuban. But yeah. he just had a certain uh, skin color to him and a certain haircut. And we just called him at Russo. 
and Russo had a reputation in those days in 1975 to walk into a shop right, yeah. get a piece of bread, cut it open with his hands, and go from fucking bologna, Oscar Mayer, put a piece on the thing, put salami on it. He would take a head of lettuce, break it, sprinkle it in the sandwich. And if he could walk out of the path mark, he was the star. You know how many times that kid did this? 20 times. Go Wait. into a sandwich, rip open the meats. And then he, and then he would, like, sh- shove it with stuff he's stealing? No, he would just make a sandwich at a supermarket. Oh, just go straight into, like, the deli. It just, like, takes out. a lot. So nine out of, five out of ten times people would step and say, hey, you can't do that. So four security guys would go over there. That would give us the light on the other end of the store to stuff our <laughs> pants with Hubba Bubba. We would walk out of there That's with three go. ten packs of Hubba Bubba. And uh, then we would have to be back at school at one o'clock. And we had this teacher, Miss Walsh, and she's like, you motherfuckers, I've been up against the best. You guys are coming into, with, into my class with a reputation. I had gotten left back. But they did me a favor because they put me with the crew I belong. These guys were future Aries. In the fifth grade, there was a teacher named Agresta. I was not there yet. I was still in Catholic school beating up the nun. But that Great fifth story. grade class didn't like that teacher so much. The teacher used to put a coffee container on his desk. And one day he got up to go to the bathroom in the morning. And one of the kids in that fifth grade class opened up the coffee and put a hit of bladder off the uh, acid in it, closed it, and Mr. Agresta went to lunch and never came back. And he came back the next day, and they had a big speech about somebody put Mr. Agresta in the hospital. He had hallucinations. And that that was your grammar school. We got to name that that. The Ari <laughs> Shafia. Yeah. So at, <laughs> that class had already that reputation. Like these uh, motherfuckers, this was like Anthony Balzano, Dominic Spichial, yeah. uh, Charlie Gizzy, who every time a plane went down, he shot it down from his seat through a window. I mean, these kids were fucking nuts. Richie Colombo, these kids hit hard. You know, so they, they, put you, they did you a favor and put you with people that are more your they speed. They put me with people. The class I was with was a good... When I became a dummy in the seventh grade and I got left back, they put me with the right kids. Dude, and the idea, the idea that, they would, that you would have a gang of thieves where it's like, I'll distract them, you fucking get them for this, either way we're going to hit them. God. Because you were always the guy... I mean, you know, with that, with that uh, Christmas plan of returning presents that you didn't buy yeah for store credit you always the guy who was like you made a living almost it seemed like off fucking shoplifting uh, it 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 i rem- i wanted to rob this gas station yeah it was the winter of 81 and i wanted to rob this gas station across the street from my high school why so it was because they had about 800 in there and the guy was always by himself and I knew the owner of the gas station. He wouldn't press charges. He was a Cuban dude. His name was Georgie Amico. He owned an Amico. So we just called him Georgie Amico. He'd go in there and put 20 on the arm if you needed it. He was a decent guy. But yeah. his real business was Coke. He was deal? a real Coke salesman, but the gas station was his front. Okay. And I knew this. So... I wanted to rob the gas station legitimately, so I'll never forget walking to Pathmark on a Sunday night, buying a water pistol, taking it home, drilling out the hole in the middle, fucking putting black tape around it, and making it look like a whatever. But guess what? It didn't evolve into that because I got caught shoplifting the gun like an asshole <laughs> that I was. <laughs> and I started you didn't make it that far. I started crying. I told my mother had died, and my little brother wanted to buy the gun, and I didn't have money to buy it for him. And the woman left me go. She was like a six foot four lesbian on Pathmark. But then I figured out how to rob Pathmark. You had to rob them after ten. Well, the security only worked on shifts, 
So Pathmark used to have an album section. Okay. I would go in in the right. daytime, take the albums I wanted, and I put them all in the W section. With there was a fence there, but I could still stick my hand in and take the albums out. I can't tell you how many albums I, I had an album collection Whoa. from all the albums. So I would take any album I want, five of them, six of them, put them in the last bin, go to Pat Mark, buy ice cream, bananas. And fucking do what I had to do. It's been a weird life. Uh, Dude, getting caught, though, is one of the worst. Because I've been caught, too. And I've seen people get caught. I saw some, a lady get caught about two years ago at CVS near me. And they grabbed her. The dude from the fucking uh, back came in and grabbed her. And it was embarrassing. She's like, she's like, I didn't steal shit. And they're like, we're going through your bag. Call the cops. We're going through your bag. And she goes, I didn't steal shit. She's being all tough, you know. And as soon as they're like, what's this? What's this? Then she changes her tune. And just starts acting exactly like you act, where it's like, oh, please, please, just let me go, please. You know? It's really weird. I actually, in 1995, I actually wrote something out without knowing that I wanted to start a coalition on anti shoplifting to let people know anti. because of how much shoplifting I had gotten away with and how stupid the system was how I had broken it down so I was a good kid Ari okay my mother dies mm. something happens inside Strap of me I get, I get a twitch I went from doing little things like riding a bicycle to if I walk past your house and I saw the window open I tricked myself into going in there and if I went through your jewelry box I took some jewelry I did that one time it was cool I made some money, but I knew I didn't want it to be me. But then the drug trade came in. And this is before people, when cocaine came, it moved so fast that you didn't have, a t you didn't have time to buy a safe. So, you know, once you start hitting drug dealers. That's not smart. That's, I, but I was hitting them. I was hitting them one a week, confusing them, throwing them off. I would be the first one there the next day. I don't know I nothing. I mean, but if they caught you, you're not going to jail for a fucking week for shopping. No, they, they caught you, you're shit's fucking... going to go down. Yeah, shit's yeah. going to go down. But at that point, I, I wouldn't rob you if shit was going to go down. I had it covered. So I went from that level, and then I went out to Colorado. Yeah. And when what? I went to Colorado, I brought that thievery mentation. And that Mentality. place... That place is easy to steal anything. Why? Why? You know, because Why? when I moved to Basalt, I still remember walking three miles into the city of Basalt. We lived in a place called Holland Hills. And I remember walking up the corner and, like, knowing that I could walk into that store and steal a soda. And, like, I was just, I was good in New York. At that point, I was Frank Sinatra. If I could do it there, I could, do, could it do it anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah. you know, little things. I, I just... I, there, I love there was, the moment where you know, you're like, oh, I can for sure get away with this. It's not even a question. You know, sometimes when you're like, oh, I might take this, you're like, I wonder where all the guards are, where they can... But there's a moment where you're like, and it doesn't always happen, but you're like, oh, there's literally no chance I'm going to get caught here. I see the lady not looking at all. She's helping a customer. Yeah, I'm totally fine. I still and remember being at Glen, Glenwood Springs, and I figured out that I could go shopping, yeah, fill up my cart with groceries, put the expensive shit under the cart in that long piece. Uh huh. I would pay for my groceries. She would give me a receipt. I would load my groceries in front of her, and then walk out the store with three hundred dollars in the bottom rack. With the thing right underneath, I was it's doing the it best. With, I was doing it with bench presses. Back in '83, I was doing this in Colorado. They never looked. As they a never looked at the bottom. I would you go to what? Glenwood Springs. That was a big city, and every Sunday, that's what my man Jimmy Burkle and me, God rest his soul, did. We'd go to fucking Glenwood Springs. He would get a cart. I would get a shopping cart. We'd each buy groceries that we needed for the house, but we'd go through the gym department and they had weightlifting plates and benches I would just put 245 pound plates under there they cost like 50 bucks 
and I'd walk out of there with them. They'd still they, be groceries. They never look- I, at all, that point, all weighted down like it's a fucking. <laughs> there used to be this place called Crazy Eddie. I remember Crazy Eddie is insane in New York, but he had locations everywhere. He had a location. In in, he had a location in Paramus. I found a way. Crazy Eddie is insane. I would go in there and take an album that I really wanted, but I'd put it in between my thumb and my forefinger. And all these other fingers here had two albums in between them. So I walked up to the counter, my counter yeah. being in my left hand, with the albums in my hand. I would probably have seven albums in this hand, one being covered tightly by the album and my thumb. When I walked to the counter, I dropped my arms they rang up the guy in front of you. They rang up Lee. Now, you ready for this? I walk yeah. up to the counter, and I reach down and take the two, the one album out between the thumb and my forefinger. So there's still three albums here in between my hand, and I'm holding tight to them. She asked me how much for the albums. She tells me twelve ninety nine. I give her a 20. She gives me my change back with my left hand. With my left hand, she reaches for the bag for me. I take the bag, and I switch it to my right hand, and the bag covers the three albums I had in my hand. Wow. Now, all I, now you got a block that she gave you. all I got to do is walk past a security guard Show him the thing, and he don't care. He's getting eight sixty an hour. He wants you to rob the joint. He uh-huh. fucking hates him that it won't uh-huh. even late lunch. They won't let him wear his afro. You know, he's fucking pissed. So I would <laughs> yeah. walk right past him. I mean, I became uh, what That's you a call good one. a street That's a merchant. Good one. You know, I ate lunch because I I had I went to That's Ari's one, one day. I went to my best friend Ari's one day, yeah. and I went to pee, and as I went into your room to get an envelope for a fucking letter I had to write, you're yelling from the kitchen, it's in the fucking thing. When I go in, I look in the garbage, and I see a American Express expired Ari Shafir card. Do you think that mattered to me that it was expired? I would take that thing and go to Chinese restaurants and get the lunch special and tipped them $10, they wouldn't look in the book, they would sign it, and I'd eat lunch every day with Ari Shafir. That's when had the thing like that, it wouldn't go through. You yeah, it the wouldn't thing go like, through. Take, mm-hmm. They wouldn't even know till the end of the day that Ari Shafir car was expended. We didn't see Fight 26. You yeah. don't see, I don't see, I don't see, you don't call. Nobody. I always would, remember I always remember when they were like, you gotta leave a credit card here for safekeeping. It's like, yeah. I was all, the thought was always like, go get a fake credit card and give it they to were, these people. They were always, or, or an expired they call, one. They called under the limit cards. It's either this week or next week. I got a kid growing up from my high school into the podcast, and he's gonna talk about a time. Church, what's that? I, I robbed one of his roommates, and that, he had a, he had like a, I robbed the speakers, but he had a check from the government, some type of check, and I go, this is no problem. I could check this in ten minutes. And my friends like, how can you do it? And I had an inside guy that worked at a bank. I grew up with him, and now he was an inside guy at a bank. This is eighty three. This is when things were a lot lighter. I would go in there, whatever check I gave him, if it was 800 bucks, the deal was he'd give me 400 cash. He'd take care of the check. Whatever it was, a social security's check, he would just mother's get a government check, you, cu- you have a check, you come here. Hmm. But he had a side deal with young hustlers like me and you. Let's say you and I wanted to put up a show in Jersey and we had to give a $5,000 deposit and 25 for, to the bar. Okay. We would go to him on a Friday and go, lend us 7,500, and he would tell us, I want 10,000 back here by Monday at 9 a.m. And he'd go into the vault, give you the cash, and you better be there by 9.59 on Monday morning. Oh. 
you'd make money, he'd make money. You knew it would happen, right. You know, the, the, that's how different the banking system was. That's how it seems like that's how the movies start, where then you get robbed. You, you made 1200 you're like, sweet, 12000 you sweet, we got his, his money. And then all of a sudden you get robbed, and you're like, oh, now we can't pay him back. And then that's when the movie starts. That's when you know, when starts. I was like 17, and, and my mother had been dead for a year, and I kept questioning God, and then I said, fuck it. I have to inflict the pain on people that people, that society inflicted on me. What's the best way to inflict pain on people? It's not to beat them up. It's to go it's through good. personal possessions. Oh, yeah, so they feel violated. And nobody likes to go home and see their drawers on the floor. So I started with the people that I knew didn't like me in North Bergen. If you didn't like me, you were going to get robbed eventually. If one day I came to your house and I'm like, Ari, right, what's going on with that ass? And you're like, 10 bucks. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You told me and leave $7. Yeah, well, it changed my mind. Sorry, take it or leave it. You were going to get robbed. Not that night, but eventually I was going to rock your world when you least fucking expect it. <laughs> so I became a, I became a revenge robber. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but my, but my revenge uh, robbing. What a great. Yeah. What made it? What made it funny was that I was so. It just to show you the state of mind I had at the time. It would be like Ari, we're yeah. brothers, right? You and me are brothers. I come to you. I take an eight ball from you. You come to my house, I give you the money, you give me another eight ball. Uh, then I come to you and I go, listen, give me a quarter, and I'll give you the money. And then you give me a quarter, I don't give you the money. You're not e missing any stakes. You come to my house, I tell you again, I fucked up. Give me an ounce, I'll have the money tomorrow. And then I do the whole fucking ounce. I don't know what my point was. Because the fucking weed Revenge stuff. robbing? Revenge robbing? Revenge robbing. Okay, so now you'd come to me with every right in the world. You'd call me a loser, a fuck. How can I do this to you? You were my best friend. You gave me a chance. Ba 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 ba. Now, I gave you a couple weeks and I'm going to pay you back. And right about I pay you back, I bump into Lee Syatt, who tells me Ari's bad mouthing you all Ari over town. He says, you're a scumbag spick. Guess what, Ari? You're Sitting going down, and I'm going to play you. I'm going to play you. I know you like Spanish chicks. I'm going to start Spanish chicks. Send them to your bar. And I'm going to get one of those Spanish chicks to actually suck your dick. And then I'm going to find out what your shipment turntable is. So if you, if you meet Lee on Fridays at 11 in the morning, take your Coke, cut it, and stash it, I'm going to know that. And then I'm going to make sure she takes you out on a Friday night. And I'm also going to make sure you get sloppy when you're out. You're not thinking about your house. Now, if you're smart, you probably live with your Jesus, grandmother dude. upstairs. Oh, Fuck. yeah. I was That's that so good. so fucking devious. Oh, I my was, God. I was, I was that good, Ari. And then wow. I would make sure you didn't live with your grandmother or whatever. And guess what else I did? What? The night what? before that girl came over. I went to your house, gave you a hug, kissed you, told you how much I loved you, and gave you $100 and bought a gram of Coke from you. Wow. And I left. But before I left, I asked you to go to the window to go to the bathroom, and I'd leave your bathroom window open because 9 out of 10 people leave their bathroom windows open. When they take showers, they open it up in the East Coast with the steam yeah. and the humidity. Or dumps or dumps. So now here you are an hour away. And I got I could use your house. I could jerk off on your pillows, wipe my ass, wash the laundry, come back, and you still wouldn't know it. So I would go through your house, take the ounce of Coke, take whatever Coke you had, because this is a revenge hit. <laughs> I'd take everything you had, the Coke, the containers, the scale. I'd dispose of everything, and I'd, and I'd disappear for three or four days. You get back from the city, your Coke is missing. Who was the last person at my house? Joey Diaz. I was a good customer? No way. No, it was Joey Diaz. Who, because I wasn't the only person who came to your house. It was Friday night. So obviously there was 15 people. You told them you were leaving at 8.30. Yeah. So now here you are sitting there 
thinking Go about on, what 15 people robbed uh-huh. your house, and you put the word out. You've put the word out on the street that you got robbed. Guess who's the first motherfucker that would knock on your door? You? Me. What would you say to him? Ari, what happened? And you look at me with like the Jew eye. What the fuck is he doing here? This is one of the guys I thought that robbed me. And I go, Ari, what happened? And you go, (laughs) fucking somebody robbed me. Some motherfucker. I'm going to find out who it is. I hope it's not you. And right away I go, me? I love you like a brother. Why would I fucking rob you? In fact, why would certainly would you come back to his house immediately? Yeah, so I'm your brother. You. I want to find out who it is. Let's get a gun. Let's go kill this motherfucker. And I would point you at the wrong person. Like well, I go, it was, it <laughs> was that fucking. It's a, it it's, was, a double, it's a double. Like it was that. So here's the story. I owe Bert Kreischer for a quarter ounce of coke. Yeah. I don't want to give him the money, so I blame the fucking theft on Bert. And now I make you go get Bert an illegal beating. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say, who was here last night? And you'd say, Segura was here, Rogan was here, Shah was here. Bert came kind of fucked up. It was Bert. He's been acting funny lately. I see him putting up tweets about what year he wants to go to and what band he wants to go see. And all of a sudden, you're like, he's right, you're right. He was acting funny. So right away, I lifted the suspicion. It's on to Bert, and you and me are still friends. They were just doing tons and of And then I'd wait, and I'd do it again to you. Now, you got to remember, I had four of these motherfuckers going at one time. What I was doing with you, I'm doing with three other people. All because they charged you because the price of Coke went up one day. <laughs> because like, one nah, day they cut play. me off. One day they got swarmy with I me. I know the feeling. You did something one, wrong to me. Yeah. And I won't I won't rest until I've gotten you back, until I know you felt pain. I, I get the feeling, man, where it's like I'm making my life's mission to fuck with you, and that's all I'm going to do, and, and nothing can talk me out of it, and you will be fucked with. I mean, looking back at it now, uh, honestly, silly. the reason I have p- problems taking pictures with people and people saying that they like the podcast is because if you really knew the craziness that I entailed, you know, I told the story on uh, Sicklers last week about taking a flight from Colorado to yeah. Newark, and it's me and a soldier in an aisle, and it was in 83 when you could still fly on a plane, and I remember looking at the soldier going, when was the last time you got high? And he's like, man, not since boot camp. I, you want to get high? And I had a wooden pipe. I filled it up, sparked it on the plane. Ari, right, this is how crazy I was when I was 21. I did not give a fuck. I fucking sparked it on the plane, gave it to the soldier. Sparked me it and the, on, the, we, on the plane? Oh, this is yeah, like still it, smoking section. There was a smoking still. section. There's no, about, weed section. There no, no weed section. No, there was no weed section. <laughs> and people started popping their heads up. Who's smoking marijuana? And the pilot came on. He's like, I've just been informed. Somebody's smoking marijuana. I'm like, and then the waitress came to us. She's like, it smells like it's waitress. coming from over here. And I'm like, how dare you? I'm with an American soldier. <laughs> you know, and I'm, not, and I'm like, fucking. But she kept giving him a new guy. Now, this is the beauty of it. I got a pocket full of money. I got a suitcase full of gold. I got a little Coke. I got some hash. I'm, st- I'm good. I got, I got about 25 Gs to hold me over. I get up to go to the bathroom, and the stewardess that was giving me the Maluka eye, her purse was there, and it was open. And I no. just remember sticking my hand no. into the purse, no. taking the wallet out, oh my God. taking the cash out, and throwing the fucking purse into the garbage, you dirty bitch. <laughs> And oh, keep, then they injury. came over the loudspeaker, <laughs> and they're like, "Somebody stole the purse's uh, money. Please return it. No questions asked. It was in the garbage." And as we landed, they go, "Somebody found the purse's garbage uh, purse in the garbage can. I hope you rot in hell for taking the purses." That's how fucking crazy I was. Wow. That was a. Di- and then the other day, I talked to a friend of mine. He goes. The first three weeks you moved into my house, I bailed you out of jail. And the first three weeks you robbed my roommate's house, you robbed the gas station. I was on a tab because I, it was Joey against the world. I would dress up in a suit, Ari. Yeah. And walk into an apartment building. I'm looking for Ari Shafir and Associates. Ari Shafir and Associates don't exist. 
Yeah. It's a law firm that don't exist. And I would start on the ninth floor and go downward and knock on glasses. Come in. Hi. Is this Ari Shafri and Associates? No, it isn't. This is Kendallman Accountants. Okay, I'm sorry. But guess what? Out of all those knocks on the door, one of them wasn't going to say anything. And I would open the door anyway. Do you know how many times I opened the door and there was a bank deposit bag waiting to get deposited? And the chick what? went to the bathroom. And what? I just, just that- happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I would pick it up, put it in my pockets, walk out of the building, walk a mile, open it up, and there'd be 800 in there with a bunch of checks. And I'd just throw the checks away in a Burger King bathroom. Oh, my God. Like, I had that luck for a long time. And if, um, they, if they catch you, if you open the door, they're like, excuse me, like, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything. It's uh, Ari and Associates here? I'm like, no. I'm like, okay, sorry. And they just walk out. You can't get it, caught. In 85, I was living in San Francisco, hiding from the Boulder police on credit card shit. And I got in a uh, place, in a, in a, it's called a hostel now. It's in the, it's in the heavy, di- what's the heavy duty district there where they'll stab you 10 times? They in have a name for it. No, in San Francisco. Tenderloin. The Tenderloin. Oh, this yeah. was a hotel in the Tenderloin called the Virginian. And I became friends with everybody in the building. And there was this old guy who took to me, but not really. And one day I followed the maids. And I go, let me fucking steal her keys. And while she was in the room, you know how they used to stick their keys in and leave them hanging? Mm -hmm. I took the whole roll of keys. (laughs) I took the key out and I fucking put the key on her tray. (laughs) So she didn't know for, for a roll... I was robbing individual apartments. If I didn't like you, I robbed you. So the bookie, the guy that I didn't like, he was a bookie. I would go up, steal all his lottery tickets and all his bookie money. I did this about three or four times. I would do it in a way to play with your head. Like, I was just, you know, it was such a That's so devious. It's so devious. Because it's not just just stealing for you. It's stealing for... To hurt them. It was, I was a fucking tyrant when it came to that shit. I have a thousand of those. And then they became drug about the addiction. They became basically about the addiction. There was this kid I fucking hated growing up. And, you know, he was always a cheapskate. I fucking hate cheapskates. If you make me take a ride with you into the city, you right, you might as well ro- roll a joint. He would roll really skinny joints. When you roll a real skinny joint, it tells me something about you. It tells me okay? I don't want to waste a bunch of weed. I don't want you taking away, uh, you know, four hits left. Yeah, I don't. No, I'm gonna save money by by rolling yeah. the fucking this aid stick. It looks like a, a guy with AIDS fucking ankle. Yeah. So I, I I just didn't like the guy, and then he got into an argument with a friend of mine. And my yeah. friend busted him up. Busted him up. And because I was friends with him, he always had like a little animosity to me. And we still hung out from time to time. We just kept it light. And in 84, he becomes a, he thinks he's in the mafia and he starts dealing coke. And he pulls me over one day and he's like, I got the best coke in town. I got to be honest with you, he had some dynamite coke. He lived with his retarded aunt. All she did was sit in the kitchen and watch TV all day. (laughs) He lived upstairs. So one day I just happened to catch him leaving for lunch. He worked and I went in his house tiptoe. That's how good I was. I was a Listen, I loved the idea of stealing. And then in 81, I saw a movie called The Thief with James Caan, okay. and that put me over the top. You thought it when was I, cool after that? Yes. When I went to Colorado, I tried to train uh, in how to open up safes with with. Uh, was there a class, like bartending well, school? No. Before I left New Jersey in 83, I became friends with this guy named Tommy. I'm not going to say his last name. He Tommy was a we- he, he was a Westie. He wasn't a safe cracker. He knew a safe cracker. What's a Westie? So, 
a Westie is a part of an Irish mob. Oh, okay. There were like 17 yeah. of them, and then they took over the J Jake Javits contract that belonged to them. That's Hell's Kitchen. Okay. There was a big turf war over that, but I didn't know this guy. Like, I don't want people to think I knew him through a family member. I hung out with a family, and he was close with They were all from Hoboken. So me and him, he used to like get me jobs in warehouses because he knew I knew how to case a joint. <laughs> like if you come to me and go, how would you rob that joint? Let's take a walk around it. Let's take some pictures. I'll tell you exactly how to get in there. Two options. You know, we got to do this with the alarm. You got to assume they got to alarm. He was a, he was a, he was a puzzle solver. He, I was. He made me. Me and him. Uh. He taught me. So what oh, he cool. would do as part of his surveillance would be, before they rob the warehouse, there's always an inside man. So the inside man was Ari. You know what Ari was? A shop steward of the union. He hates this fucking place. His job is to get better wedding conditions, but he's not getting that for his employees. So he turns to a guy like me, and he goes, listen, fucking, I want you to rob the place. On a Friday night, they got 300 large in the safe. And that's got nothing to do with the employees. That's just like... No fuck, alarm. We'll, we'll chop them up and fucking pa pa pa. That's just an unhealthy, an unhappy employee. Yeah. Right, right, right. An employee who's been shit on. You know what? Right, you right. Got, and they're like, fuck this place. I don't give a shit about You should have the manager's them. job, but you gave it to Lee, an outsider that worked at Remco for 10 years. But meanwhile, you've been here seven fucking years. Yeah, but why am I going to respect what? this fucking company? You got a friend like me. Why am I going to not steal when I see an opportunity? Yeah. One day you went back there and the safe was open, and you asked the manager how much is in there, and he goes, 400000 but we usually have seven by the time the uh, people come to pick it up. One day you and I are doing coke. You happen to slip that information to me. And you just stock it away in your brain. I stock it away in my brain, and then I throw you a thousand bucks, and I go, do me a favor. What's the best possible scenario to get in that place? And I would draw, I would, and then what you would do is go to your friend and go, I want to hire Joy Diaz to help us stock. We need to help a stocker. And I would come in and help you stock, but at the same time, I'd look at the warehouse for different holes. Where was their holes wow. that they could get into? In the house department, there's always holes. In the East Coast, 9 out of 10, it's the bathroom window. People open it and close it when it gets steamy because it's humid. This is, like, would, this is like the degenerate version of Star Wars. I would, Star Trek. Yeah, so wait, wait, I would, I like, would, it's only a little portal hole. Yeah, get no, no, no. <laughs> I'll take you into deep dimensions of thiefing. And then I would kick the whole window in, go in, open the door, let you in, and we both into broke into different sections of the house. Wow. But I had a knack to know if there was cocaine in the house, I exactly knew where it was. My knack. I had a nose for it. I knew exactly where the coke was hidden. And I also knew what a prepaid package was. What does that compared mean? Compared to what a package is. I know Lee's selling high amounts. Just because I found 2000 in the door doesn't mean Lee has a pound hidden somewhere else. Lee left that two ounces in the door. So if a piece of shit like me comes in, he gets happy with the two ounces and he runs off. Lee comes home and says, Ooh, I'm lucky because they didn't find the 20 large and the 16 grand I, and, the, and, the, and the fucking pound of coke I had hidden in the closet under the shoe box huh. so I would always find the initial package but then I already knew there's more in this house and it's somewhere and that's what was my knack was what about feeding uh, the dog cheeseburgers oh no what? that was just one time no there was a <laughs> well, in 83 I was really really desperate I was really desperate. I was owing. I was up to my neck in alligators. I owed bookies. I owed loan sharks. I was 21 years old, and I didn't know who to fucking turn to. Yeah. And one day I went to visit my stepfather. Me and my stepfather were at war, but I would go to his neighborhood in West New York just to lure up conversations with people. And some people would see me and go, hey, how you doing? Here's 40 bucks out of respect for your mother. I would always come back not empty-handed. 
you know I always came back with something when I went into this neighborhood I used to work at a floral shop I would go in there and tell them the story and they throw me a 20 whatever and one day I go down and I bump into a guy that I had worked for 10 years earlier when I was 7 and 8 he was an okay guy he was a pussy but he was an extreme minded bookmaker he was very good at what he did and he was part of that book called The Corporation they don't mention him in there that's how low key of a guy he was what he had done was he had a flower shop in West New York New Jersey and he had a butcher shop but his real money was a bank he had set up in New York. So he would go in. A bank? The, what do you mean a bank? It's a bank. It's a it's a apartment on 118th and 7th that you wouldn't even look at. And if you walk up the stairs, you smell good food. There's usually a guy in front of the building. There's usually a guy on the roof. And there's usually a guy on the floor where the numbers operation is going. And they're in there taking numbers, taking sports yeah. numbers. 310, give me $5 straight in box. Yeah, okay. You know, that type of shit, you know. What are we talking about? But what do you mean a bank? What was that? He said he just said that guy that's what a bank. A bank. That's what a bank is called, where all the central action comes in. So your, your turf is the comedy store. Okay. Right now, right now at 1 o'clock, you'd be at the comedy store drinking and people come up to you going, Ari, what time the number go off? And you're like, three o'clock. Give me five seventeen times ten dollars. Give me eight fourteen times ten. But then at three o'clock you gotta call all those numbers in. You call them into a bank. They put them on a bank wall. If a number comes out, they pay you out, and then you pay out the customer. Interesting. It's the central okay. location of the operation for the day. Okay. Okay, how do we get to this stuff? Cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers. Stealing. Oh, so. 21, you were desperate. All right, so. <laughs> Don't do drugs, everybody. <laughs> or do. <laughs> I'm 21, I'm desperate. It's the summer, it's the winter of 83, and I got to get a score. Like, fucking around, like, yeah, I was making some two, three grand scores, maybe getting an ounce of Coke, but I wasn't making any profit. I wanted, I was looking for a fucking, a good transaction. You trying to buy a kilo from Lee, me going partners with you and telling you that during the transaction, we're robbing Lee and we're splitting the coke and Lee will never know what hit him. You know, shit like that. That's what I was into. So, I fucking went to West New York one day and somebody gave me money. And I had money. Something happened. And I bumped into a bookmaker that I had known for a long time. Now, at this time, I'm looking to leave New Jersey. I'm already in talks to go to Colorado for the first time. I bumped into this bookmaker. How you doing, Coco? Jesus Christ, you've gotten so big. He gives me a hug. He owned the flower shop. And the legit flower shop that did great as a flower shop. Okay. Like it was a sec- it was a successful business as a flower shop. So we talked a little while and something happened that we talked about sports betting. And he goes, "You know what? I recently got into sports betting." And I said, "Well, you want me to put bets in with you? I got a thousand friends that'll do it." And he goes, yeah, you, uh, the week is Monday to Monday, and you pay on Friday. So I said, fine. So in those days, Ari, my deal was for the week, I'd stock up on you. If I won, I'd collect. Yeah. If I lose, I'd disappear for three weeks. you come look for me for three weeks, and after three weeks, you gave up. What, the bet was off? No, I just, what are you going to do? Yeah. You've been you've been driving around for three weeks looking for me and you can't find me. What are you? It's amazing do? to me they ever took bets without taking the money ahead of time. Oh, that's the way you do it because I trust Ari. I grew up with Ari, so I give Ari the. His name is the Flaming Jew. 
We uh-huh. don't mention no names on the account. So the phone has a tape recorder on it. So when I pick it up, I hit play and record. And you're like, this is the flaming Jew. And I'm like, yeah, you're down minus 180. Yeah, okay, what do you want to do today? I like the Knicks minus six. I like the Nets plus the four. And I like uh, 506, five dollars straight in box, and 604. Five dollars straight. Where did you get all the numbers then? Well, all the, all the lines and stuff. Because like, if you go to a casino, it's all there. But the lines come out in the newspaper in the Daily News. Really, the Daily News, all the lines of shit like that. Yes. So wow. every line yeah. comes out in the Daily News. Every every horse that's playing, the Post, that piece is a shit because <laughs> they make their own lines. Oh, so if you look at the Daily News, loons, if you call somebody in New York and you go, Lee. What's the line the Knicks? And they go six and a half. My first question is, is that the post or the news? Because you're beating me, cocksucker. That's the post. Because you want you want the best deal no matter what. You just yeah, want the you want the best yourself. deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. might save me the hook. And the post is seven and a half. Lee's got it at seven. I don't want no hook. So... Right. Oh yeah. We put the bet in really with get it. fucked when you get two two bets in the same line with different lines. Right. So we same get game. we but you take it. If I called you and I get and you got it for me from seven and a half and Lee called you and you got it me from seven and a half, you got it already. You got a percentage, an extra percentage and they all add up. Mm-hmm. Bookmaking is a game of percentages. So back to the story with the dude. Guess what Jeez, happens the the first week? Okay. I think we, we, we bet basketball with him. We were good at college basketball, a couple of us. We beat him with college basketball, like in January. Because I would take the smaller colleges, Seton Hall. I would look at those colleges. I wouldn't look at the Why? big Saturday and Friday Why? game. Because most of the money that's gambled is gambled on TV games. Right. People, People are going to be watching watch it. What they live. If you live in Boston... You're not going to get the Arkansas-South uh, Carolina Gamecock game. You know, that's the game you want to fucking bet. That's your action. So most out of ten, bookies go on. They know who's going to play, and they know that those are going to be the money games. What games are playing in your area? The national you, game. Where do you live? New York? You're going to get the Jets and the Giants. So all those bookies in that area, they're going to move the lines on you one way or the other to fuck they, with you. Oh, right. And they know and they know people want to bet the home, home yeah. team there. So what you want to do is, let's say you love the Boston Celtics on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, the Boston Celtics, if they gave you 16, give 18. They were taking it down. Wow. But nobody had the balls to give 18 and a half on a Friday fucking night. But Boston covered it like clockwork. And then the Boston bookmakers would raise it to 20. What? Oh, yeah. They knew well, it. Now it's just greedy. Yeah. That's how you do it. But to go back to the original story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We beat the guy. We beat him three weeks in a row. Okay. The final week, I mean, I'm not going to lie to him, but this guy was sort of like family. As a child, I went to his daughter's wedding. My stepfather had gone to work for him first before he broke in with a different guy. So I knew this guy. So one day, I see him outside on a Friday. I go to collect, and he goes, come into my house. He lived on the first floor in this apartment building. I walk in. He walks me into the kitchen. We sit down. There's a closet in the kitchen. You know, like, the closet where your mom puts the linens uh-huh. And the big pieces of things to put stew in and shit like that. We don't mix those clothes. He opens okay. up that room, he opens up that door, and Ari Shafir, the top thing was 50s, the one before that was 100s, the middle shelf was 20s, and the bottom shelf was 10 and 5s. Wow, that much cash. I clock conservatively 80 grand. What? 80 grand would have changed my life in more ways than one. 
80 grand. That's a twenty thousand dollar going away party. That's ten bitches and two, <laughs> two and four ounces of coke in a hotel in, in a hotel in Newark, lick, licking my asshole with a firecracker in my eye. Chinese See, that was style. That was the thing they always said about you. It was like when Joey Diaz has money, he doesn't save money. He just lives harder. <laughs> like no, back in your blow days, it was like it was like oh, yeah. you'll do blow until the money's out. And then if you come into like fifty grand for a movie shoot, you're just doing a bunch of blow. You're not putting it away. You're just like party's on. When I did the longest yard, that was the most money I'd ever seen in my life. I remember that. I remember and, that. And you were and, just like, ah, this has to Fun. No, I I gave money to my wife every week. Oh well, whatever. I was very Same smart, shit. but every dollar I kept really went to cocaine. Oh, okay. There you every, go. Every and it was it was the first time in my life that for seventeen weeks, well, the first six weeks I was clean, except one night in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But then when I got home, those next eleven weeks. I did coke six out of seven nights, and I would just sit there and add. I got four more weeks left. I got thirteen five coming in. That means I got to give Terry eight five. I got three thousand thousand dollars more for coke. By the time nineteen eighty seven came along, my cocaine addiction had went from having fun with girls and eating that pussy. And spinning their eyeballs and putting coke <laughs> rocks in their asshole to doing math. Did you know that the addiction? What, what do you mean doing math? Oh, how much? Oh, is I love doing math when I did coke. Well, after three or four hours of snorting coke and the paranoia went away, yeah. I busted out a notebook and I would just write scenarios. If me and Ari owned the newspaper company, we would have distribution in fifty states. 50,000 papers a day and a quarter. Let's pretend the trees cost three cents in Africa. Oh, I you love know, that. I what, mean, if, what if, what if, what if, yeah, on anything? That's you the ever, cocaine ever, shit. That's the <sighs> cocaine talk. That shit drove me into not doing blow with people. Why? Be because then they start looking at you doing coke and they get all creepy and they're like, what do you think would happen if George St. Pierre fought Abe Lincoln? And you're like, are you fucking retarded? Why would you want to see that fight? I don't know. <laughs> Abe Lincoln had a great uppercut. All those type yeah, it must, I think I, whatever, all the that beard type of shit, all that shit type of shit drives me fucking crazy. He had height. He had reach. Well, what if Godzilla? That's talk. What if Godzilla would fight Mike Tyson? You know, are you fuck. Speaking of which, fifty years old, Mike Tyson's about to fight. You see that? They, they offered him a bunch of loot. He's going to fight? I thought he was, that was just a thing he did. Like, I'm saying Shannon shape. Briggs. Oh, my God. Mike Tyson still has people, people will two good that rounds fight. People, of him. He's got people two will watch that fight. I yes. will watch that fight. Mike Tyson has two rounds in him that if he connects with one punch, he's going to send you to the hospital. I'll watch that fight in the same because way I'm going to go watch the Pixies. Like, they ain't that their best, but... It'll remind me Let of me some tell good you times. Something. At 50, if you get hit that hard, it'll change your world. I stepped on my daughter's water bottle last night, and it crackled in the middle of the night. I almost had 10 heart attacks. I went in there to kiss a goodbye, to kiss a good night. At about 10 o'clock, I stepped on that bottle. You've never seen a man, my my girth. <laughs> I did like a burpee into like a. You ever jump off the diving board and do a jackknife? That's exactly <laughs> what I did. I was so pissed that that bottle was on the fucking floor. Whoa, oh, that's funny, dude. I remember you in when we were speaking of shoplifting in particular. We're like we were at the Bob Hope Airport in uh, in Burbank, and you went off to one of those kiosks, and you just came back. You just came back like th it was like this. It was like you were gone over here, and then you were like, it was like this. It was like I go, where'd where'd you go? And you're like uh, nothing. And you're like what? And you just come back. And you just show me some Tic Tacs, just like like that, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> and I was like, what is that? You're like, shut up, nothing. I stole them. You know, it's so funny that right <laughs> now we have all these so-called charities that are taking money to help comedians. Everyone's just I shoplift for charity. I don't apply for any of those for some reason because I had my grants. I had my grants while I was a comic. 
I robbed and pillaged as a feature act. Oh, yeah. I What'd robbed you do? and pillaged. First of all, the craziest thing I ever did was I had to take a Frontier Airlines for flight, which they lost my luggage on the way there for an audition for Analyze That. They lost it. I had, when I left Denver, when I left Newark, I smoked one cigarette. I was 400 pounds, yeah. and I used to smoke a pack an hour in those days. And I got on that plane for four hours, and when I got to Denver, I realized I didn't even have enough for a pack of cigarettes. Uh -huh. And they were just about to close. I was taking a connecting 940 flight, and they were just about to close. The gates were half closed. There wasn't a person in the place. And I l looked at it. It was just typical Joey Diaz shit. I looked at it. I went under the fucking gate. I went over the counter. I took a pack of Marlboro lights out of it. I walked out. I opened it up, threw it away in the garbage. And I went straight into a bathroom, into the lap stall, and lighted a cigarette. You and followed up shoplifting with illegally smoking it? <laughs> yeah. Right there at the airport. I got on the plane like a fucking captain of Enterprise, and I got thousands of those, like where I just... Oh, my God. You know... Dude, you, 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 you had the you, scam. You you had the scam at the fucking uh, the tickets, the free t uh, two for one tickets at the, the comedy, comedy store. You store. ruined that. You I, ruined that whole thing. I ruined it. Not really. I enhanced it. I put more people <laughs> in there. <laughs> what ruined it? I got. I had people in there by the fucking handfuls on a daily. You were telling. I was like, why don't you just give us tickets to pass out to people? I'd be like, hey, oh, you, you, when the comedy store was failing, there was nobody in there, and be like, just give everybody tickets. To be like, if you see somebody playing golf with somebody, it's like, what do you do? You're comedy. I'm like, yeah, here, go to the comedy store. We'll get the drinks out of you. Those people are never gonna go. First so of all, I was room. the original fucking. I was the original fucking telemarketer for Enz Mitchell. Okay. He I was in him charge from, of from, telemarketing. From nuts? No, before he did that, he was the when he first moved to L.A., he was in charge of sales and marketing for the comedy store, oh, which was yeah. worth two gots in those days. If I knew Mitzi, she paid you five dollars an hour and a cup of mm -hmm. coffee. Mm -hmm. Give you one so spot a month. Part of his plan was to go upstairs and call people and businesses. It was me, Larry Vizales, Shane Matash, and a, another black kid. And from one to five, we would go upstairs, commission only, and get sell tickets. So I have a backstory to stealing. Okay, I just don't <laughs> steal. There's always got to be a back reason why I steal from you. Okay, <laughs> I'm a good guy. I'm a decent <laughs> Christian. <laughs> so they they were giving us 50 cents a person. So I would call like Atlas Body Shop and go, hey man, I would have to lie. I would have to say Eddie, because let's say Eddie, uh, what's the other guy? I did the, how, I did the longest yard with him. Uh, the wrestler? Come on, guy. Chris Rock. Oh, let's say Eddie. Chris Rock would pop in on the store on a Tuesday. I would have to call people on Wednesday and go, listen, I don't know for sure. But Chris Rock was here last night. He's he's coming back tonight. Really? I'm giving you 15 tickets. Hold on. Let me ask the rest of the guys. Okay, we'll be there. 15 tickets. Then you gave a, only eight showed up, but they would give you 50 cents a ticket. So it's four bucks for you. And they wouldn't give us no commission, a no hourly rate. Oh. So I was making money, even though I was doing it that way. When I say money. If I was making a hundred bucks, but then I found out there was a set of douchebags that were giving away cards that said "Get one, buy one free" into the comedy store. And one day I went to the front and I found the stack of them. And it was December of '98. I was a starving comic, yeah. and I actually borrowed somebody's car and I drove to Universal City. I illegally parked. I still remember the guy in the scooter following me and me kind of telling him to, to go you away. Can't that, there. that I was mentally challenged, that I can't walk because <laughs> of my knee. Just I, I don't know what I said to the guy, guys. And it's everybody knows that from December 24th to about January, this town floods with people from colleges that are going to play in Rose USC. Bowl. 
and Rose the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Bowl. Yeah. And what's the destination? Where does everybody go? Universal City. So I would go to Universal City with 300 comedy store cards, and I would actually give them out. And I did this for fucking two weeks straight, and I got to tell you, I made like a 1000 bucks. Wow. Because they were giving me a hundred a card, a dollar a card. Uh, so even if the because you were getting people in, they'd make money off their drinks. It was still worth it for them. So I did this straight, January, the, the, February, March. By the way, this March. part is not a problem. This part is just you helping the store right. and then paying you back but for doing it. Then they that. busted my balls. <laughs> people Why? get fucking guilty, <laughs> and they go, "You're doing too good." We're thinking of modifying it. That's I the said, store oh, way. Gonna modify How can we pay you less? That's and the I, store and way. I still remember, I don't want to mention no names, but I still remember the measly cocksucker that said to me, like, he gave me a check, and he's like, you're making more than me. So we, there's got to be a way to modify this. This can't be... Why the fuck would he care? He's making and, the same man he made last I week. And I look at him and I go, you're making more? I fucking go to Universal City with no money, Lee. It's not like going to Universal with $10 when I could go upstairs and get Cuban food or go get ribs. I had $3 in my pocket. That means I was 37 away from getting a package of Coke. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking for wallets, pocketbooks. I'm, I'm giving out flies, but I'm looking for wallets and pocketbooks. So they came to me with some bullshit that they wanted to give me if I maintained 400 tickets a week. And above, they would give me a salary of like 150 cash. And I was okay. like, give me some time to think about it and let's see if we can work something out. Fuck you, motherfucker. <laughs> I got a stack of cards <laughs> and there was four shows that weekend. And for three weekends straight until we got the pay fixed, I would wait. I would get there at six o'clock at night. And anybody I would see online, uh -huh. I would give them a free card with my name on it. So for three or four weekends, nobody. And they got were all, What you understand is they were already coming in. They, they were, were already about coming to pay in. Full price they for a show. They fucked me, so I had a fucking attack back. The revenge robber. It's like the Chinese with this fucking antibody. This is a spear. That means there's more to come. That's why oh they're not God. planning nothing for October, because <laughs> that's they they fucking. They struck first blood like they did the Rambo. <laughs> they people were about to spend forty bucks for two tickets, and they were in the line with money in hand to give it to the store. And Joey Diaz would go, "Oh no, man! Why don't you just spend half price? Save use this. The then he'd make his dollar, and they'd lose twenty. They lose and I, and in I the line. And then when floor. I got there, like, why don't they do that? I was like, "Cause Joey Diaz ruined that game. <laughs> there's no and, more. Cause somebody no fucking more. ratted me out. I'm <laughs> not gonna say out? who ratted sounds like me out. Sounds like a Bobby out. Lee move. That sounds like a no, Bobby Lee move. No, no, no. Bobby <laughs> Lee's always had my back. Not at all. Not at all. But those. Listen, when you're a starving comic, you have to find. Uh, you, you know, have to find ways. Day, I, listen, on top of selling tickets, I sold cigars on the phone. I had to be there at six in the morning. There was so one what, cigars? Uh, cigars. Cigars were very popular here in 97. Uh, Le Leslie Moore, the, the chick who Aaron Kushner fucked in the ass then left her for fucking... Uh, Demi Moore. Yeah, Demi Moore. What's is that? Dem no. Yeah, Bruce Willis' ex-wife. Yeah, Demi Moore, yeah. They Jared put a Kushner cover, fucked Demi they Moore? Put a, they put a cover on... Aaron Kushner. Oh, Ashton. Ashton, Ashton whatever. Okay. Listen, what, what, what are we? What's <laughs> a political yeah. guy. You're you right. It's my fault. About. You're right. It was my fault. I, I should not. I should not have fucking said anything about it. It was. What I'm all about that one. Me for you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so and then Demi Moore in '98 made a a, a a cover came out of her smoking cigars. Oh so, yeah, tons of I remember cigars. That. I remember that. It was cool. Opened in Hollywood. There was a cigar bar next to the Improv on Melrose. That if you were a comic, the guy let you go in there and smoke a cigar and talk Next to him to, in mm -hmm. Arabic and spit hummus on you and shit. I didn't need that. <laughs> so I was never a cigar guy. I'm Cuban. It's I'm born into that. I know exactly all about it, and it's not for me. And uh, I don't know how we get into this. What's the, so I sold so cigars to make on, young phone, comics, everybody, yeah. on Sunset and across from Rock and Roll Rouse. Which, why, by the that, way... That was the Hooker Hotel, right? There was the Hooker Hotel, but if you cross across the street from that, it was a headshot place. 
where you on could the get, corner. You could get duplicates of headshots. Headshots, yes, next yes. To that, the set. I remember that place went under business because that was the place you went. It was a little yeah, pricey. That, that and I was, was like, yes. yeah. I was like, I'm glad next you've done to the, this whole industry done. Next to the seventh veil. Vale. Yep, yep, yep. And then upstairs there were offices, and I would go there Monday through Friday and call different grocery stores and sell bodegas the package of cigars you see when you walk in. We yep. gave them like a fake humidor valued at $300. It cost a dollar. Some Chinese guy <laughs> jumped off a balcony after he made 300 of these things. <laughs> and, and, and we sent them that. And I think you made a hundred a package, two hundred a day. I was making pretty good money there. Then I signed with Sutton Bart and Venari. They were the oh, best in commercials at the time, and they would get me out on commercial auditions. And and when I came to L.A., that's I the thing did, with all these with, with all these like um, fundraisers now for comics. Like it's like I don't know, man. It's like I, I want to support them, but also like you better learn how to scam up some money. That's what you got to do as a young comic. Figure out how to get some money in your pocket. You know, uh, when I was a young comic, yeah. the, the main reason I got into comedy was not to work. I didn't want to ever have a day job. That was... That was your was goal, a, is to have, have no job. Person not to be someplace at a certain time at 8 o'clock in the morning. It sucks. Day jobs I, suck. Unless I absolutely, positively have to be there, like American Express or whatever the fuck it yeah. is. So when I got into comedy at 30, I got into comedy knowing that I had to put everything aside. But I got to be strictly honest with you. Till the age of, I started in 91. Till 97, 98, 99, yeah. I could have got arrested in those years multiple times for big shit that sometimes to cut a corner that's what needed to be done yeah in 93 against my best will and judgment after coming out of prison <laughs> i had to take down a drug dealer with a dear friend of mine got rest in peace he's dead i had to take down a drug dealer for whatever amount of money i had what do you mean take him down what? On 181st Street, right there in your beautiful New York City. They used they used to be heavy 100. drug activity. Yeah. So we, we would case a joint. See what first, that's where Yeshiva University is, 181st in Amsterdam. Yeah, so no, this is off 181st and Broadway. Okay. If you look, when you're coming over the bridge, you can see that if you pass under the, under the George Washington Bridge, you can make a left. Okay. And those are side streets. Those side streets were all drug dealers in the 80, er, late 80s, early 90s. Okay, so. It's great, great background music for this story. <laughs> yeah, tremendous. This is what you <laughs> yeah. need. So, fucking, you would, I would go with Ari. And Ari was the driver. Ari would drive. We'd pull up in front of the building. i go, Ari, go to the bodega and get a soda. Okay. Always make believe you're going to buy something. Don't sit here double park because the cops going to drive by, grab your plates, and they're going to knock you over on the other side. So go to the corner. If they ask you what you're doing here, tell them you're going up there to check out a movie theater on 181st. You didn't know what it was. Okay. You always have to have an excuse to be in Harlem in those days. So I would force you to go to the corner and buy a fucking juice. And if I know you, you come back with a Cuban sandwich. Or a fucking fried banana sandwich or something. It's Puerto Ricanville. Yeah. I go upstairs, and they sell coke for thirty-five a gram or twenty-five a gram cut. It's just oh my oh my god! I would sell it for sixty-five a gram, whatever, and give them the twenty-five dollar gram. So I would go over there and buy coke for myself. Yeah. But at the same time, I I take orders from my friends in Jersey. Oh, dude, that's what I did. Remember when? Uh, remember when Zen? Zen Dispensary on Santa Monica and, uh, and La Cienega, they had that deal with it. If you get a star, some, it's a lot of the weeds had a star on them. And if you did, those were buy three, get the fourth one free. And so I would just tell all my friends, like, I'll go buy weed for you. I had my card. I'll go buy weed for you. They're like, well, give me two eighths. I'm like, absolutely. I get them two eighths. I get somebody else one eighth, and then I just take the free one. And before I deliver those eighths to each of them, I take a little nug out just sure. to try it. 
A little something. That's what you do while you're that's doing... What you, that's what you do. That's what you do when you're a starving comic. So what me and this kid used to do is this kid got a DEA jacket. That's what, a badge. That's, what Ralphie, that's what Ralphie said to me once. He, he went in and he goes, get, he would say that same one. He goes, get. he gave me like 600 bucks. He goes, get as many breast strip with this as you can. Ask for a deal if you can get one, but whatever I can get with this. Because uh, he was going back to wherever. And then I was got. I was like, got my fucking shitload. And I was like, here... And he goes, that's all. And he's like, yeah. And then he goes, here, take like five for yourself. And I'm like, thanks. He goes, and that's in addition to the ones you already stole. <laughs> it's like, all right. Thanks. Yeah, you got to assume the guy's stealing. <laughs> Two or three. He don't give a fuck. You know, that's the thing about doing business. So what we would do is we study the pattern of a certain drug dealer. Yeah. Drug dealers in those days were very smart. They'd only have two ounces in their apartment at a time. So if they got under, they they got arrested for possession, but it'd be Minor. Under, under a lower whatever. And we, when they would run low on coke, they would look at Lee, and Lee would either go to the ninth floor and get it, or he'd have to cross the street and go into a building. And that's where we came in. And we would put hats on and jackets and sit on the corner with a cop car and make sure Lee saw us to make them break their fucking patterns. Oh. And once they broke their patterns, either we went upstairs and shot, you know, kicked the door down and said freeze. No bullets ever went off. I did that once after that with him. I got a little money and I got the fuck out of New York City in November 93. Wow. In the daytimes, I used to go to the comic strip and get yeah. 20 tickets and I'd have to sell them for ten dollars a piece, and I keep five. I'd sell them for twenty and keep it all. <laughs> fuck, <laughs> fuck, Lucian. You know, when you're a starving comic, yeah. Why even go back there? You're like, I'm well, not going to perform there anyway. I'll just never show to, up again. Then I went to Colorado and was a starving comic. I refused to. I would get. But you a must job. have been a thieving star in Colorado. You must. You're fucking training oh, on, the, on the real training grounds, and you go to Colorado, fucking Southern High School in Colorado. There was a, a role there from November of 94 to March of 95 no exaggeration I probably made 40 grand returning espresso machines at $450 a pop that's great that I was, is fucking I, and I, and great I would walk out of the store with it it was never even official shoplifting that's how you which, well, how, did that, how did that go down Explain I would walk into the store very Joey Diaz, nobody sees me, no Merry Christmas, no nothing. I'd walk into the store, I'd pick up a coffee machine, the most expensive espresso cappuccino in 1991, that was the most, 93, that was, the, it cost $450. And I would walk in there, pick it up, and go right into customer service and go, hi, my grandmother just gave me one of these. And I got two of them. And a lady would go, what a shame. They're great, aren't they? They're fucking tremendous. <laughs> You're but the ideal customer for two one? minutes. <laughs> and she'd go, okay, we got two options. We could give you store credit or we could give you whatever. So I already negotiated with Ari. I had two options here. Ari, you need something from that store? Yeah, I do. I need a, a computer bag oh, and I need okay. something else. Okay, yeah. What's it worth, Ari? Yeah, if I, if I get them, it's 300 I'll bring them over the house. Give me one thirty cash. Done. So I would get the store credit, give it to you. You go there tomorrow and buy whatever you needed. I did things like that. Or right. I'd, I'd play. Right. The, the first one was always, I always thought about my addiction. So the first one was always, do you want cash or do you want a check? Or would you like us to mail it to you or store credit? And I would sit there and go, you know what? Somebody steals mail from me. You know what? I'll just take the, the cash. <laughs> and here's the funny thing: if the thing cost cost four fifty nine, you'd end up getting like four eighty because they give you tax what? back. Oh, oh it was, it was, wow! It, it, it was crazy. Wow! It was crazy. And I was oh doing. Oh my four god! Of those you're getting at, you're you're, get, you're getting from, their price plus the government's price from November of eighty, from November of ninety four. 
to March of 95, I could legitimately look at you because they take returns all the way till February, Valentine's Day. Right. And then Valentine's Day starts, and you walk into Macy's, you pick up the biggest blanket that costs $1,000, you walk right to customer service. Hi, I bought this for my mother. She doesn't like this blanket. She's allergic to this one. What a shame. Do you have the receipt? No, I don't. My mother lost it. Oh, either we can mail you a check or we could give you cash. If they said they mailed you I mean, I would check, like to try that one now. I would like to try that no, now, but I wonder how you can get away. No, you can't get away with it. Why? You can't get, because if you go into Walmart, there's a checker. And if you come to bring something, they put a check on the box yeah. before you even walk on the thing. That's right. I finally That's, right. That's a good point. That's a good point. I had a, and Kmart, they probably have it I had a Kmart by my house. Listen, yeah. I lived on 30th and Iris in North Bergen. Okay. And it, I, I lived behind the strip mall that had a pizza place. Murphy's Bar and Grill, Ladizio's Restaurant, a liquor store, a big barber shop. But across the street from there was a Kmart. So Kmart was my training ground. I would walk into Kmart and get like floor mats and something else, like 60 bucks. Why? Floor mats for a car. Floor mats for a car. And I would go in there and go, hi, uh, I, I can't use these. And they go, okay. And then after about a month, they started asking me for my license. Because they and, started to recognize you? Yeah. And they're like, well, you, weren't you here last week for a headlight? And I'm like, yeah, I got the wrong headlight. So now I had to start to go to Longmont and start to linger in Longmont. I did like three of those in Longmont, then they asked me for ID. Okay. You're out. So now one day I go to Bold and I go, you know what? I'm going to start looking at people's receipts. You know how nobody, th- everybody throws their receipt away? Yeah, yeah. People throw their receipts away. So Right I'm, outside. Because right in their outside. hand, like, I don't need this. So I'm making believe I'm on a pay phone all day. And meanwhile, I'm looking at people walking out in the wind blowing their receipts. This is my famous one. I see the wind what? blow. What? I see a guy walk out with a lawnmower, and I see a, and I swear to my mother's grave to, to whatever that's. This is why I believe. Oh in the my pop. god! This is, this is why I believe in comedy. That if you give yourself, if you go, I don't give a fuck. I'm not getting a job. I'm doing it Bill Hicks way. I'm gonna be a pure comic. And if I get evicted, I get evicted. If I live in my car, I accept it because I'm doing what I want to do. Yeah. That's how I lived then. And my landlord's rent was $400 a month. It's, let's say, pretend it's, it's May 31st. Yeah. I need $400 to pay the rent. This guy's my friend. He's Ari. I can't let him down. Okay. I, I'm leaving today because I need $400. From here, if nothing happens, I, I'm going to Toys R Us because they would give you Jeffrey dollars, and I had friends with kids, so at least I could bring toys to your house. So I'm sitting in front of Kmart, and a guy is walking out pushing this lawnmower with this little young kid, and he's holding on to the receipt, and the wind takes the receipt, and I run and over. And you're just and I, watching them. Like, there I'm goes. watching them like an eagle. And I pick up the receipt, and the receipt says like 440 with tax. I fucking go, it would be a little bit too suspicious if I just walked in here right now. So I got in my car. Okay. These are the stories that people don't believe. I got in my car, and I shot to Longmont on E. The car was on E. And I made it to Longmont's parking lot, and I walked out, and I I bought the lawnmower on sale. And I even remember getting one of the kids going, hey, can you help me put this on the thing? He helped me put it on the thing. I go, thank you. I walked it in, (laughs) and I gave the guy the receipt, and I go, I just bought this thing. My wife just got it for me for Father's Day. And I do have a receipt. And I have a receipt. And the guy looking at me going, no problem. 
And what? all of a sudden, the idiot that helped me load it in my car is walking in there, taking his gloves off. He's like, it's a hot one, isn't it? Yeah. And this guy's giving me back $500 in cash. And I'm, t- and I'm going to like- home, paying the rent, and having $20 left over for Chinese food. Wow. That's when you give yourself the comedy. Shit like that would happen. Like, I paid the comp from 93 to 97. I paid for my rent delivering Chinese food. Was I delivering Chinese food? No. Well, I was delivering Chinese food, but I was selling Coke. Yeah. So I would make you call the Chinese restaurant, get two egg rolls. That meant the gram, and I come over to the house and sell you the Coke. At least I got an excuse for What if you wanted house. two egg rolls? That meant I get brought you an eight ball. I mean, what if you just wanted two egg rolls? That means I bought you a gram of Coke. I don't care what you want. <laughs> because it got to the point that the Chinese people were going, you're getting more calls than we are. What the fuck is going on here? So I told my friends, don't call no more unless you place a delivery order. Like, it was shit like that. Like, it, it did not stop. I still remember being 20... Two years old, living in Aspen, Colorado, in a hotel yeah. with my I wife. I, to I be. still can't imagine you in Aspen. It just doesn't seem like I'm in Aspen, Denver, Colorado. I, can see, but. I am. I yeah. am the. Uh, I am the. Uh, I'm living on on the second floor of, of this hotel in Aspen. I'm friends with the landlord, but he's not really going to let me slide on the rent. Okay. So across the street is a sandwich spot called the In and Out House. It's great sandwiches, but they put like a, a bean sprouts on your sandwiches. I'm from Jersey, so when they ask me, "You want everything on the sandwich?" I go, "Yeah," and I bite in. It's a cucumber, and then I bite into bean sprouts, and I nearly go off on the guys. <laughs> and they're like, "Relax, we're from Buffalo. We get it." But these white fucks—that's how they like their sandwiches. <laughs> They want bean sprouts on all their sandwiches. But they had, that's the only curry I ever ate. They had a thing, a curry chicken sandwich. It's good. With lettuce and tomato that was delicious. So anyway. And you I, never went back to curry? <laughs> for like 35 no, years. never you, you again. You had one never good experience again. and then I'm like, I'm retired. Yeah, because they didn't have sandals on. Once <laughs> I see the sandals, I get nervous because their, their feet are always dry. If you don't put feet on your cream, I don't... If you don't put cream on your feet, I don't want to do business with you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> you ever see people with dry feet? You can't trust those people. <laughs> you I put cream on my feet every day. You got cream, red dirt. You ever, you ever go to a Hindu place and the guy's got sandals on? He's a sweet out of a guy. But his feet haven't seen cream since the Great Depression. It's all Shingles like- of, Yeah. I don't want to eat your food, dog. Look at your feet. How can I eat when I'm I'm focused on that fucking skin You're just like- falling off your skin? I don't know if it's leprosy or foot fungi. So I... Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this. That we it, it had to be five in the afternoon on a Friday, and we had to be out of there or the the week rent Saturday morning by twelve. Okay, and I'll never forget that the In and Out House was just a little place that you could three people could be in there, and it had a door, but it had a window that slided. And the first place I hit was the In-N-Out house. Even though I knew the owner and I knew the employee. Who? The employee's name is Steve Schiavone. We still talk on the phone. He comes to all my really? shows when I go to Buffalo. And it's we crazy laugh how you're friends with all these people. I fucking, somewhere or another, I climbed through the window and I must have gotten 600 bucks. I was still light on the rent. I don't know what happened. I don't even know if I got 600 bucks. I, I may be lying to you. I probably got like $200, and you know I took a sandwich to go. So the next day I get up in the morning, and we have just enough money. We go, me and my wife go, let's go grocery shopping. And this is why I watch people when I walk. I go down this aisle, and I see this woman, you know, pushing a cart, and she's got her purse. But you ever go to the bank and cash a check? They give you your money back on an envelope. 
Yeah. Remember those days? Yeah. If you yeah, yeah. walk into the bank, they will put your money in an envelope. Yeah, it's her, always her, like just put it in your pocket. You're a fucking you're a fucking target if you walk out her, with one of those envelopes. Her, her envelope was sticking out of the purse, and I'll never forget walking up to her, taking like a can of corn, and just wiping the envelope and walking down the hallway. And as I'm checking out with the beans and shit, I walk out and I hear the lady going, "Help! Somebody stole my money." And I ran back to the hotel. It was eight hundred dollars in cash. I stayed in. I paid the rent, and the landlord sold me four quaaludes for twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I was just—I wasn't a thief. I bumped into things. I wasn't a thief, really. I bumped into things that you got to ask yourself. Either I'm going to take it or somebody else will. <laughs> I, like, mean, I, I get that logic. Like, I get that I logic. A, like, it's already gone. I had a thousand of those stories. Like Christmas Eve, 94, 95. Yeah. I am flat broke, and I got a letter from my attorney on Friday before Christmas on Saturday that I'm not going to see my daughter. Uh, what do you mean, anymore? I, that holiday that uh, okay, my okay. ex-wife decided I'm not going to see my daughter I'm furious okay. I'm furious yeah. I'm crying I'm getting a knife I'm going to kill them yeah finally something happens it calms down I make a few calls I get a call back they're going to let me see a Saturday from 2 to 4 but now I got another dilemma I, I, I got empty pockets and a frown I got three dollars and I'm hooked on fucking coke. Yeah, how are you gonna see your daughter? So I fucking first thing I do is I go to fucking Toys R Us and I go in and I pick up a computer, I bring it to the counter, we, I don't like this. They give me back three hundred Jeffrey dollars. They didn't pay you cash. They paid you with Jeffrey dollars. And I went and spent Toys Jeffrey R dollars. Toys R Us did? Toys the rest of toys that she wanted. Okay. And then I went and brought back another computer. I don't like this one. I mean, all in one day. Let me tell you something. I ended up getting going home with a bicycle <laughs> and a box full of stuff in the car. It was it was embarrassing. I'm not gonna lie to anybody. But in my world, there were big corporations. I was a little comic. I was just trying to get by. No excuse for my actions. By nah, the way, nah, fuck that, dude. I, I always see that. I don't. I don't mind stealing from big corporations. Even hey, now, I don't, I don't care. mind taking bread from the from mouth of decadent. But that's what it is. You see fucking so, Walmart. You see fucking that's how Macy's. I saw it then. Fuck it. Take that money. That's, that's how, how I pocket. saw it then. I really did. That's how I and still I'm see it now. I'm very sorry to have that thinking, but here's the fucking kicker of this yeah i go home i pack everything up for her i finagle some cash some way or another i maybe i brought back something i came on that may dnf may dnf was always a good one i kept them short they were my go-to they were my last if i couldn't make a dollar i also had yeah. other scams i would go to the university bookstore and pick up a bunch of books, and again, I'm returning these, and they give you 60 bucks. So I had 20 scams going, and one I'm living in a, when you live Damn. in a college town, there's a thousand scams. Damn. You go to Sears and steal CDs, and go to the local record store, which and they'll buy them from you for two dollars a CD. There was a place called Things Remembered. Does anybody remember those stores? Things remember. You went in there, and they sold knickknacks. It wasn't like Spencer's, but it was sort of like Spencer's. They, they, they sold pens, Parker pens. Oh, oh, oh. Parker oh, oh. and mm -hmm. these other pens that were Some with an M, plated, really nice ones. And silver plated. I would go and look at the gold ones and go, I love that Schaefer, pen. Schaefer pens was another one. I, they had I nice ones. the brand. There was something that, else. They were like $30 in those yeah. days. And I would go in there and go, I love those pens. And, she, and I go, do you have it in the silver? And she goes, hold on, let me check. And she would come with the keys, open up the bottom cabinet, open the cabinet, pick it out, show it to me. And while she was showing it to me, she'd take the keys out but leave the desk open. And right there, I'd bend over and start taking gold Whoa. pens. 
Whoa. So every, and then I would walk into car dealerships and go, who needs pens? They're 30 retail, I got them for 15. If you Jew me down to 10 in, it's all By the way, it's to, all profit. It's all profit. You know, it's all pro. When I was growing up, there was a woman in town that whatever you needed, she got you. Okay. You understand me, Ari? You went she was to a her. scavenger from The Great Escape. I knew her sons. I still talk to her sons. Yeah. I'm still dear friends with their sons. They live in San Diego. But I still remember being a kid, and word on the street was I need three pair of Wrangler jeans. 32 waist, 30 length. Went by a house that night. You got them. She'd go on the on the newspaper and she'd go, they're twelve ninety nine a piece. That's uh, thirty nine dollars. Give me twenty five dollars. And if you needed speakers, she did speakers because she lived off credit cards, and all she did all day was take orders. A blender. I need a three thousand dollar blender. Done. But when I get back here, there better be 1500 cash on that table. So I always learned that anything you made was a profit. Right. Because, I mean, if you're stealing, you have no No overhead. matter what. No matter <laughs> yeah. what, it was a profit. Yeah. And I lived like that. You know, then I went to Seattle. And in Seattle, I remember I, I set up a fake phony gambling line with Josh Wolf. Josh Wolf owned the building downstairs, the bar, Lobo Loco. He knew the landlord. The landlord had an office like what we do the podcast in. Oh. And I moved into it because it was a buck 25 a month. But I also got a 1-800 line. I met a guy at a bar one night and he was talking to me about a phone company he worked for. And I knew all about setting, selling sports information then. And the other day, Josh was on, uh, uh, you know, Brendan Schaub, and the other mm -hmm. one he was Fire telling, in, he was telling interesting Joe Diaz stories, and, and you know, like one time, uh, Josh set me up with a safe job. I had to rob a safe out of a business and carry. It. Listen, Godzilla couldn't pick up that fucking safe. This is when I. Uh, this goes back to the Tommy Kenny training. If you don't know how to bust a safe open, you don't try to take, bust it there. You take the safe home to go. Like at that and improv. You, and you have more time. Yeah. You need time to bust into a safe. You know, yeah. Lee's, Why'd father, you there? Lee's father has C4 left over from, from Vietnam <laughs> because there's a Vietnam restaurant in his neighborhood. And he's you still know, thinking of blowing once, him up. <laughs> so, what are we talking about? Don't steal this. Don't steal the safe. Hey, steal the safe because you don't want to open it up. You, you and Josh Wolf safe. in Seattle, right? You and Josh well, Wolf in Seattle. We'll get that there. time. But before that, we were talking <sighs> about safes. Jesus Christ, there's so many stories going through my head. The ADD and the reefer. I know it's a great. Uh, uh, just uh, it was just. Find it. Find it. Get there. No. <laughs> it's gone. I can see it fading the fucking, away. The fucking. <laughs> The the bad thing about the safe job with Wolf was that we were the the Yankees were gonna play the Mariners all weekend. Okay. And we were banking on that was the bar where everybody went for for a drink. So you figure three thousand three games to thirty thousand spectators and the place would be full. It was down the block from the thing. So we were ready to hit it on Sunday night after a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday stand. Nobody deposits on Sunday. I pick up the safe like Godzilla. I throw it down the stairs. Yeah. I kick open the door. I throw it outside. It lands. Frankie Three Fingers is outside waiting for me in his Acura. I pick the fucking thing up. I throw it in the fucking back of the trunk. We head to the fucking meeting location. I get a blowtorch. I get a fucking chisel, well, and I start burning blizzard. this thing, and I start hitting it, hitting it. After an hour of banging on this thing, this thing fucking opens up, and guess what's in there? What? Change. 
change. No. Like, you know, like the change for the register and shit. Yeah. I think oh, it, no. I think Rolls it, of quarters and shit? I think it totally out to a deuce. We had uh, to split it three ways. I remember telling Josh Wolf, no. well, look at it this way. At least we could do laundry for the next three weeks. <laughs> That's how bad a shape we were then. You oh, know. Fuck. Uh, oh, fuck. I, I just got, you got into... Any, you got any pointers now for people stealing? <laughs> for the young thief out there listening to a legend, be like, what can you teach my generation about shoplifting, about stealing now? It's very tough because what you're living with is a life surrounded by cameras. Okay? It is. It is a, what's it called? State, whatever they call that. I can't. Every if you're, I have cameras on every window. I have cameras from the top poles looking down because there's a cop in my neighborhood. He lives two doors so? down from me, and he came with recommendations when we first moved into the house. Oh. He goes, especially if you have a kid, you should have all these. What does those cameras cost? They cost like $40 a piece. Oh. And they all go into a central bank, and they're connected to an alarm. So everything you do now, I get a bing two seconds if you're in my yard. Yep. yep. So it's it, right now, if you're a thief, the money that I see as a thief like those people who were robbing people in Hollywood. Remember a couple for about a year? Lee, wake mean? up. You didn't uh, smoke reefer. He's <laughs> over here nodding like a heroin addict. It's too early for you to pass out, Lee. Yeah, he's over there. I didn't even give him an edible yet. 2.30. You might as well do an edible. It's time. You might as well, Fuck Lee. It. It's, <laughs> it's Cinco de Mayo all over. I know, you've had that same bottle of water there for three days. Look at him. He shaved his head. Did you really, looks, Lee? Oh yeah, he looks like fucking. He looks like the bad guy from Superman <laughs> that went oh, yeah. to an island, and, and he looks like yeah, Brando. The, he looks like Brando, fucking did a plastic surgery to look like Ochapo. Chapo. So <laughs> he's more like raising Brando. I didn't want to be a thief, uh, Ari. It was my yeah. way of lashing out in the world, and it was the simplest was thing. It was never do. that for me. For me, it was just a way to get free stuff. Was I good at it? Yes. I could, I could tell you shit. I remember being in a hotel yes, room. Yes, you were one of the best a, ever. Oh, my God. I'm living in Jersey. Hall of, Hall of Fame in, thief. And I'm living in a hotel in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And it's costing me 30, 28 a day. It's a fucking Hindu hotel. The guy falls asleep and the porn would run out. And you'd have to call the front room, put the new tape in, cocksucker. Because <laughs> it'd be like an old tape of some Chinese chick getting fucking gang raped. What? <laughs> and I'm living there for about three weeks. After about three weeks, I venture out. I start robbing these gas stations. And one Friday <laughs> as I leave, he goes, listen, the rent is up. You better be here by 4 o'clock. And I go, all right, I'll be here by 4 there. And I go and I hustle and I finagle. And when I come back, this could only happen to Joe Diaz. See, these are the stories that you got to go, what would you do? I come back and he gives me the key and he goes, you out. I tell you, you come back by 4 o'clock. It's, <laughs> it's 4.15. <laughs> so I had the key in my pocket. My first reaction is to go to my room to get my stuff. But he goes, no, 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 no. Your stuff here. Now, he was behind the counter. I knew he couldn't walk out. Yeah. I swear to God, I go to the hotel room that I'm in, that I had, and I hear people. But I open the door, and they're in the shower fucking. And right there in front of me is the guy's pants. I go in his pants. He's got a knot of fucking dough. I go on the other side. He's got an envelope from work filled with dough. What? And the chick's purse is right there. I clip her purse. And they're making noises? Oh, yeah. They're in the bathroom giggling. I close the door gently. I go to the fucking front of the thing. I get my luggage, and I fucking hail the cab, and I make him take me to the city. So he could lose me. I put a cap on so he couldn't see my face. Just in case. 
I got away with like twenty five hundred dollars. I drew the bullets away and shit. What? <clears throat> I stayed in the hotel where they killed Vito. In the Sopranos where they killed Vito. That's on the way back. I went back so I didn't I never stayed back at that hotel. But that hotel off of Route Four going on to George Washington Bridge. That's yeah. Hotel Row. That's we meet in the city. We don't want to fuck at the hotel in the city because our wives will catch us. They go to Fort Lee and fuck in those dirty hotels. So a lot of things like that just happened to be there, and yeah. I needed to make a call. You know, I had a nose for cocaine. I had, and I'll tell you what place I never robbed from that what? I could have robbed them a thousand times, the comedy store. Me too. I don't know why. I just wouldn't rob from I the comedy rob, store. I would never rob from the comedy store because the 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 disrespect I would feel from people knowing that I robbed from yeah. the comedy store. I can't it's a real forget. Chinese way of not stealing because you'll lose face for your family. I don't know how many times I pulled up to the comedy store on a Friday to get my check yeah. at 1. Remember, the checks were coming at 1. I would be there at twelve thirty, making sure the truck got there. It's like, come on, you Plus know they me. bounce a lot of the checks, so you better get your check cashed early. You gotta, yeah, you had those days. You better get your check cashed early too. Now, like I, they, I give you the check from here. You're going to check cash in place. There's yeah. no stopping to pick up Lulu. There's uh -huh. no going to sushi at this Century City with the belt. You're going right now because that money would run light, and then she would bounce checks towards the end. Yeah, she's like, oh, so sorry. So I would go down there at 12.30, and guess what I would see, Ari? Right? Who? What? Guess what I would see? Liquor delivery? Cases of alcohol waiting there. Nobody touching them. Jack Daniels. I wouldn't have even thought to do anything with that. And I would... I would Except put drink the, one. I would... Are you kidding me? You put two of those cases of booze in your trunk, you drive down to Gus's uh, Liquors, and yeah. you go make an offer. <sighs> you know they give you They're 50, sealed. They're sealed. Even if they give you 55 bucks, what do you give a fuck? It's all profit. Yeah, the, the only, only scam I would do with the store is I. you had the fucking tickets in line. Me and Sean Miller, we would, uh, the comedy was free until 9 o'clock on Sundays, right? Potluck. But it was supposed to go until through showcases. And sometimes we would run late. So at 9.30, we're still doing the fucking employees. And people would come in and we'd say, well, you're supposed to be able to get in free, but it's our discretion. So we'd say it's $5 and we'd take one two person five dollars and we go to pink dot and we get doritos and ice cream pretty much every sunday and that was about it but really we felt like that was stealing from the, the customer and not from the store well listen i knew those dudes that were the doormen there and they were making a lot of loot in those fucking days the doorman in the Tips. main room on saturday night i could honestly tell you sell a booth for a hundred I, I will tell you what i did i will tell okay. you what things i did at the comedy store Okay. One of them is very funny and very Joey Diaz esque. I walk into the com the only two things I did from the comedy store was at night I would stay there till two because I was a drug addict and drink as much as I can. Story but before up. the waitresses could get into the original room, I would go in there looking for cell phones. Oh, yeah. Well and that's stealing I, from uh, customers. And I would find the cell phone, turn it off. And the next day, in 98, there were bank robbers. There was two black bank robbers from St. Louis that had a cell phone fixing store in Crenshaw that was just a front for their operation. They robbed banks for a living. Okay. And they hung out with Chewy. They were friends with Chewy. I wasn't supposed to know about the bank robberies, but then word got out. Certain comics were getting financed by them. Whoa. They were you giving like, comics, like, yeah, man. Living money? We want to invest in you, you know what I'm saying? I remember that. I remember people were investing in a comics. In specific in comics, comics, okay? So uh, what's the fucking, the kid from Boston? He had the mafia in Boston. No. Oh, no, no, no. Benny no, Favorito no. had the other kid that paid his rent, his rental car, and gave him exposure. But the first big check you got, you got to pay that back. It's going to them. You want to live in the studio city, it. Lee? It's going to them. We'll, whatever you want. Santa Monica, 6000 a month? We'll pay it. Acting class? We'll pay it. Send us a bill. But when you win San Francisco, the $10,000, and mm -hmm. 
and they give you the check, it's just going to go right through your hands. <laughs> yeah. You're not even going to see it. They're going to give you a bounce because they're going to get their money back, plus they're going to take an investment back. Yeah. So there's a lot of comics that we're getting invested on. Who were we talking? What were we talking about him? Well, you would never steal from the store, but there were scams you could do on the audience. Okay, so these bank robbers had deals with certain black comics. Yeah, if you blow up, we're going to do it. So, okay. I liked the guy. Me and him became friends. I never asked him for an endorsement or nothing. He took me to that theater, the black comedy theater, where uh, the guy from Do the Right Thing used to host. Not mixed nuts. The uh, slick dick daddy, slick da- dick. Look at the you, know, you don't have the website today. There was a sweet dick daddy, sweet sweet dick Willie, and do the right thing. I forget what his name is, and I should be shot and hung. He was one of the original fathers of comedy. Yeah. He booked the whatever theater. Marilyn Martinez turned me on to that, and I went down there on Thursdays. But the reason why was. Because I would steal, I would every night I'd go into the original room, I'd get about two phones a week, and then on Wednesday night, I would go into the manager's office and go, hey, man, I lost my pager. Do you know where it is? And they'd go, Pages help yourself. Big. Go yeah. in the lost and found box. And I'd find three more cell phones. And I'd clip those, and I'd go down to Crenshaw by bus, and the guy would give me $30 a cell phone, Robin Harris. Robin Harris. Robin Harris. Robin Harris. One of the most underrated comics. Of all time. Yeah. He was phenomenal in fucking, uh, in, uh, in Do the Right Thing. And Harlem Nights, he was phenomenal and also God rest his soul. Was he Bebe's Kids? Was that him too or no? Bebe's Kids was his too. Very yeah. brilliant. Very yeah, fucking yeah. original. And good guy. He was a good guy to comics. So, uh, it just, that was... And then I heard they got arrested. And that was the end of that, too. Hmm. They got caught during a robbery heist. That's a good scam because you're really not fucking over the store. They're just like, ah, you lost your phone. It's, it's gone. You, it's, it's on you. Your fault. Or when people but, would come and like, I, they would get two tickets, 20 bucks a piece, and I'd, they'd hand me the bills, and I'd feel it. And they could just, without even moving, you'd be like, this is 320s. In your head, you're like, this does not feel like two twenties. This feels like three twenties, and you just put it down. I'm like, here's your two tickets, and as soon as they're gone, you're just like, it's twenty fucking bucks in your pocket. It's funny how it was an addiction for me. Like, there was a Seven Eleven on Kirsten and Sunset, and they used to have lighters with football teams on it. Uh-huh. And my goal was to rob every fucking lighter. And I would go in there, and I think my record was 12. Stay in shape. I would rob 12. I had a desk in the house when I first started dating Terry. And one night I even went off on her for opening up. The, she went to light a cigarette and took one of those lighters. And I go, why are you using those lighters? Don't touch those lighters. <laughs> those are collector's because items. Because it was like going to Carvel. They had every Major League Baseball hat? Mm-hmm. Every hat except the team you wanted. Mm-hmm. And you kept going back, and you're like, you got St. Louis yet? No. Fuck! I'm getting stuck <laughs> with another fucking Dodger hat. <laughs> so I kept getting stuck with, like, New England. I was looking for, like, the Bengals and the 49ers. Anyway, you know, it was like I did little things like that. But at the same time, you get accused of shit that I didn't do. But the best one I, I ever pulled understand. at yeah. the comedy store was, I was pulling it until today, it's well known. I've come clean with it. When Joe first started at the comedy store, at the improv, Joe yeah. sold clothes. He didn't come from a comedy store. He wasn't, Joe was Who? raised a nice Joe Jewish kid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Joe was raised a nice Jewish kid. He wasn't raised around animals like me. So <laughs> the first night I walk into the improv, <laughs> December 28, 1999, Joe Baskoff is now the manager. And he's like, it's my first night, man. And I go, you're going to be fine. Blah, blah, blah. So I coached him along. Yeah. But, you know, there comes a fee for my coaching. You know, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? Sometimes I send you a bill. Sometimes I, I don't. I just take something on the way out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, 
Joe and I became dear friends. He was great that weekend, and then Joe, the manager, would use me a lot. So I would go down there, and at night, it was well known that as soon as I got off the plane in Miami, a show didn't even have to start. Like, like, let's say my week started on Thursday. I would walk right to the club on Tuesday and go, where's the yardstick? Because mm. Papa needs to party tonight. Give me 100. Mm. Like, you know, most Just places, living money. Most places you have to do a show to get an advance. Yeah. I wouldn't even do a show. I'd walk in there and go, throw me a yardstick. And they're like, Joe, you didn't even do a show yet. Who cares? I'm not going to work. You know I'm walk coming. Back. Just give me the money. Well, we walk back, and I would at least snort. Wednesday and Thursday night, I would Miami eat for free. must have been crazy then. I would eat for free at the improv in the daytime. Mm-hmm. I would cross the street from the condo. The prep cooks were in there, and I'm fucking making shrimp scampi and shit. It was hilarious. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't even know what we're talking about. Uh, Stealing from the store. Your fee. So one night, I still remember the two nights, and we'll let you go, Ari. I know you got to go. Uh, there was one particular night that Joel was sitting there, and I noticed at the end of the night that he would put singles with singles, fives with fives, twenties, fifties, and hundreds, but he put the hundreds as close as he could be over here. Smart. So I go, fuck it. Let me just try it. You always got to try it. If it's a joke, it's a joke. They go, ah. I hugged them with my exactly. left. Exactly. If you can say it's a joke. I kind of blinded them. And as I, I took the top, right, 100 off the top. I put it in my pocket to, for him to go, Joey, put it back. He never said nothing. So I never said nothing. I clipped 100. <laughs> so I figured out a way once a week to go in there and clip them for 100. So now... <laughs> This went on for about two years. I got great at the manager clip. I would take something from a 20, a 10. I got the guy in Kansas City. I got a couple guys. With the dead guy? No, the guy that was his manager, the cocaine Uh, guy. uh, Yeah. He He didn't care. He didn't care. But the best one I ever got was I do not remember his name. It was a Monday night at the comedy store. I get to the comedy store, I walk in there, and there's three guys in there, and Mike Rick is in there. Oh, yeah. Well, Rick is doing something. When you got to the comedy store in those days at 8.01, Mike Rick had already been there since 5.45, drinking sodas and bumming cigarettes from people. So I walk in, I see Rick. I love Rick. I give Rick a hug. I forget who the other two managers were in there. Yeah. The one manager walks out, and I turn down, and there's five stacks of singles with rubber bands on them. And again, I don't think nothing of it. The manager that's sitting there with the stacks, I give him the Joe hug, and I take the top stack off the hundred, and I walk out. I take the I, when I realize and nobody's noticed at the five minutes, I take the rubber bands off. I take them in the men's bathroom, throw it away. I fold up. I take five singles, and I take the other ninety five dollars and I put them in the car under the drivers under the drivers mat. Not ten minutes later, the place fills up, and now there's a story going around that Ricker robbed a hundred bucks from the <laughs> desk. <laughs> <laughs> the Joey and, Diaz double double cross. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, Oh my god, I'm gonna play this uh and finally Riggy comes up to me and was like, I'm telling did you see me rob behind the lines? You know I would never do that. Now they're blaming me for that too. And then there was the retarded girl, Adrian, the hot uh-huh. blonde. Uh huh. She, she was so hot. hot. She was so hot. But she would leave her purse out on Monday nights. I would go down there on Mondays just to get money for Coke. (laughs) Because she would leave her purse right out by the thing. I'd see her leave, and I'd see Hart in those days was lonely, so he'd go watch comedy. And I'd slip in, and I'd take a 20 out of her purse, and I'd go see Dante. Oh, my God. She was so hot. She was not very smart. No, she was not very smart. She just had a beautiful baby, though. No fucking way. Yeah. She's on wow. Facebook. Beautiful. Beautiful. She got her life together. Oh. She was a great kid. 
If I see it sometimes, I'll give it a deuce. I probably owe like a deuce. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you, he deserved it. I took a lot of money. Was, for she blamed it on your seat. <laughs> so I'm like, this is perfect. Everybody always gets the blame. You know what I'm saying? Uh, How you doing, buddy? I'm all right. If I, I gotta know. be honest with you, yeah. If you know anything about me, you know I miss you dearly out yeah, here. Yeah, I miss you too. This uh, virus has really let us know where people's true colors are as a comic and as a human being, and I'm good with it. I'm kind of happy this happened. I'm not looking to perform, as you and I discussed. Yeah, the it's other weird, day on but the I get phone. it. I'm not going Nobody's anywhere. Nobody's looking to get on a plane. I, I mean, mostly Nobody. what I'm looking for, and most comics are just looking to get on stage. The money is like, sure, sure, whatever, but the we're mostly just looking to get on stage somewhere for 15 you know, bucks. Man, I went to the weed store last night. There were six people, yeah. and I got to be honest with you, my body froze up a little bit. Why? Because you're like, the, oh, fuck people? No, because I think that the fear got to me. Like, I can't see myself going to LAX. I'm not going to lie to no anybody. No way. No way. I'm only I driving to places. See, I'm only I, driving to places for a I while. I can't see myself stepping foot in LAX, guys. I think I would paint. I faint. Yeah. <clears throat> so before yeah, that happens, have a I'm trying to be honest with myself. Uh, there's some Indian casinos that have opened up to comedy to in L.A. I heard that Vegas is not going to do comedy till later in the year. I don't know what San Diego is going to do. I don't know. I don't what know. The, I'm uh, just uh, having fun tackling projects and just enjoying me myself. Too. I'm having. Listen, I'm not even having fun. I got to do a thing called homeschooling. I don't know if you remember. I got a GED. So I got to go through when? fractions. A week ago? What, the GED? Yeah. No, I got the GED six months before I went to prison. I thought I, uh, I could do things in prison with my life. I'd have to go in there fucking have beauty school dropout. <laughs> I, went into high school, I went into prison with a GED. And uh, this is the most difficult thing I've had to do is keep a... You know, you think of a 57-year-old man, you think of a 40-year-old man. Yeah. We've all gone through things during this last, pan, you know, seven weeks. Yeah. This has made a lot of people think, Ari. This has made a lot of real people think, you know, about their future, what they really want to do. Uh, you were making six figures doing something, but you're around people all the time. There's no social distancing. Did I tell you I saw three, three hookers on Lancashire last night? Yeah, you did. Yeah. They're not socially distancing. They got to fucking suck dick. How are you going to do that? Six I feet saw away. one that was a fucking hottest motherfucker ever with no, with a t-shirt on, with no bra on. I was on the phone with Dean Delray. And I go, Dean, I think there's a hooker walking towards me. And sure enough, she stopped and looked at me like, is there anything I can help you with? And I turned the other way. And as I turned the other way across the street, a white hooker was coming towards me. Now, this is happening. It's, it's quarter to eight at night. I just went for a little ride to smoke a joint and loosen up. And then I made the left on Magnolia from Lancashire, yeah. headed west. And as I looked over to see if there was cars coming from the... There was another hooker walking on that street from Eat from the restaurant eat and I go wow and now and there was, it was two Asians and one white girl that means that eight, that white girl's got COVID they're gonna do the second spread with hot Asians they're gonna send them over here you're gonna that's fuck what hot Asians that's Asia. what they're gonna release it through the fucking hookers that's what, through the hookers something's going on guys <laughs> but last night I was really in shock I went for a ride and I looked inside NoHo Park and you thought it was a fucking parade. Oh, uh, that's the thing. It's like people can nobody uh, have mask on. Fucking, I'm, it's I want coming to back stronger right than turn. ever. We haven't even gone down. So, We're still yeah, going up. What are listen, we doing? We're still going up. All, all I wish is that the people who are watching this are social distancing. They're wiping you, everything down. They're the washing their hands. The only thing I say is if you're a jogger, fuck it, it's on you. Don't come up behind somebody and go. So, you're like, what the dude? Jog in place for a second. We can't see you. Well, listen. Go, you go out. Everybody's become Rocky Balboa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got bicycles and skates and oh, scooters. Yeah. Oh, they're in such good shape. And helmets. And listen, I appreciate that. Mental health, you nah, know the them. side of mental health. You know, it's like I forced myself to take a shower at 9. Yeah. I forced myself to step outside by 9.15 because 
I, I don't want to fall into that trap. That's fair. This is this is the hardest it's been for human beings because we're avoiding the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. We're avoiding becoming obesity and getting just fat and soft. True. And we're avoiding the number one thing you got to really work on Which is. is your mind because your mind is the most powerful weapon there is. And it'll take you to places that you've never been to at night. God forbid you take two edibles. I'll take you to places that don't read the don't news on to, edibles. Don't yeah, read the news on edibles. That's why I had to stop doing edibles at night because I was going. Once my wife goes to bed, yeah. those four walls creep up on you, and you become a different person. All of a sudden, I'm looking at a picture of a black guy putting a firecracker in his eye. And I'm That's howling. Cool. Normal That's people hilarious. don't laugh at that. Normal <laughs> yeah, people normal. don't laugh at that shit. Someone, someone got seriously hurt. Somebody <laughs> well, got I don't hit. know, man. I'm laughing. So Last I night I read an ad that said somebody got run over by a plane in Austin. I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was, I'm lucky I didn't take this guy to the track because I would have definitely had nine losers. You understand me? <laughs> Who gets hit by a fucking plane? The More odds on that. Got, lightning is better fucking, odds. Yeah. You got better shots of lightning. Yeah. <laughs> so what am I going to see? What are your plans? You're sitting tight? Till- I'm sitting tight for a bit, at least another month, I think, and then, um, and then we'll revisit because who knows? I don't know, man. I'm having fun here. At some point, in the back of my head, I might hit the road and just, like, get in the car with my dog. Are just you prepared fucking... for 40, 50 people? On stage? Yeah. What do you mean prepared? In the audience. Are you prepared? Am I mentally prepared for that? Yes. Are you mentally prepared to go up in front of a room that's capacity has been cut by 60%? Is it worth it for oh, you? I'm, oh, I meant to prepare for doing Dude, I just chose the comedy store for six people. Have That's you, not the problem. Okay, That's no, no, in no. me. You and am I, I meant, Am I mentally prepared school, for 50 people yes. coughing at me? Not are so you, much. Are you prepared for, like I told you last night, the five people coming into the room before the show starts? To ask you yeah, what that's music like, guys, you guys, want. Guys, we got to all be water, different. We got all separate. If you, but it's going to be the etiquette now. You can be like, guys, limit the contact. I'm going to come in the back. We can't do meet and greets. I'm totally fine with 50 people in the audience because that's 50 people more than nobody. Right. You I and agree I are these I people doing stand-up comedy yeah. for the money. We're doing it for the stand-up comedy. So right. all we want is get the right. fucking laughs right. again. It doesn't matter what the pay cut is because that was never the fucking incentivizer in the first place. I, what we're I'd doing rather, it for is the fucking laughs. Uh, I'm supposed to be in Brad June 4th through the 6th. I'm supposed to be in fucking I, Long Island in July. I don't know. I hope that it happens. It doesn't look like it will, but I will also commit it to a, like a little residency in Brea twice a month, once up in Knoxville. No Oxnard. planes, no, no getting in that airport. I don't That's care, a big I don't thing. care if it's 50, 60. I want the room to grow. I want to help it grow on those nights. So I have a get to guy. There's some Indian reservations that are thinking of having comedy shows. Yeah. It's got to be social distancing. The first time I don't see social distancing, I get up and leave without the check. I don't care. My health it is more happen. important than the check. So uh, I appreciate this. Kind of, I appreciate the time we've done together. 20 years we've been in the trenches with, without Joe Rogan, with Duncan, with fucking Renazizi, with the poor kid who died, Freddie Soto, God rest his soul. We were there when the store was kicking. We were there when it was dark. Empty. And yeah. then we were there again, so I got no regrets, brother. It's all, yeah, it's like, honestly, like what you said, like, you got to think about anybody who's like, well, I don't know if I could do comedy, I might get a job. It's like, well, it was a good run. It was a great run. 20, 21 it years of stand run. It was more than I ever expected. And I'm yeah. happy I get to do the Church of What's Happening now. It's on Spotify now. I'm happy You're to do that. on Spotify now, finally? Yeah. The church? I'm happy to do a podcast because... Mm-hmm. It's at least some outlet. Yes. Without it's that, it would, I'd be going nuts. It's about staying alive, and it's also about bringing a certain smile to people's faces. I don't want to do podcasts with a mask on anymore. I'd rather watch Exorcist when you're home. It's the same difference. What People want to see human contact. Yeah. I was doing a podcast with guests, and I had to wear a fucking mask. face mask. So right away, what you're watching is what you're avoiding. Right. So I'm happy that Zoom came along. 
Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll get Leo figure you. out what we're doing. You can do this with everybody now. You're just like, Look, I got the picture you gave me in here. Yeah, Josie, Josie Wells. Josie Wells. And, uh, you know, say yeah, hello nice. to the family. You got your records right down there? I got the records over here. I just gave Lee two edibles. Dude, I, I got Dark Side them. and I got Rumors. I want to listen to both of them with you. Rumors is good. Rumors is good. Rumors is good album. Well, yeah. whenever you come back and whenever you're ready, like I said, you know. When, when it's time, when it's like legit safe, I mean, then and for I'll sure the I'm same. going out to LA. Listen, yeah. now all the Sopranos are seen. So I'm expecting to hear from them. There's going to be a very short window to shoot in New York. I expect to be flown in and out of there very quickly. I'm looking forward to shooting this so the movie releases next March 12th. Damn, the Many damn. Saints in Newark. And I might go on with my life. I could work around and put a little tour around it. By that time, I'll have a new hour. I don't know what I was saying 60 days ago. It's been 60 days. I don't even feel, I don't know if I feel yeah. like that anymore. Yeah, I'm like, what's the material? Oh, so I got to start from scratch. Everybody's going to start from scratch. Yeah. I'll I wonder what these fucking... comics are going to go charge 80 bucks a ticket for fucking, to be on stage for the first I, I time in not. four months. I will not. I will not. I will start brand $20. This is a yeah. grassroots. I'm taking money out of your pocket. Everybody has taken a hit in this deal. My tickets will start at 20 bucks when I perform at improvs. And as time goes up, I'll raise them to 25 and mostly see how it's, leave see them how there. Yeah. That's why I feel people be, I'm blue collar. I'm a blue collar comic. You go to a fucking movie, it's $12. The movie sold out. What's going on over there? Oh, some fat fuck named Joey Diaz. He did a show called This Is Not Happening. Let's go see what he is about. You go over there, it's 25 a ticket. They give you a nice strong drink. I, I don't feel that it's guilty. Fun time. Yeah, I'm not there to sell time. T-shirts afterward. I don't want to do nothing. Listen, you're not gonna make me go okay home because I'm not gonna see you afterward. So don't even think about it. I don't want you touching me. I carry Lysol. I'll spray it in your eyeball. You know what I'm saying? I'll spray it in your fucking eyeball. You got Lysol and Mace in both hands. Oh my god, I got <laughs> Which everything. Which one do you want? I got the burger gloves. I got the DEA gloves. So if you shoot somebody, the gunpowder. I got everything going. So I'm ready. I'm ex yeah. listen. I'm ready to. I gotta be honest with you. But I'm having fun. I'm not ready to get on stage tomorrow night. No. I'm not ready to get on stage I, I would next do it, week. But I'm not ready to put I'll on a really you, good show I right will now. I'll tell you when I'm ready to get on stage. I will probably it will probably be in July, after this really opens up. I want to give them a breather. To I want it to open up and see how people's reaction is, and then I'll take it from there. Because it's not about then, making, the, making it legal to open up. It's about uh, feeling safe to open I up. I want to feel safe. I yeah. want to feel safe. I'm going to do the end. I'm going to drop a little weight on my end. That'll always help. Be my good. blood pressure has been very good lately. My sleep good. has been good. I've been lifting twice a week for a guy 57. That's pretty good. And when I lift, I lift. You know, I put, those, I put some kettlebells in. I do some farmer walks. I make it happen. So I drink water. I get good sleep, and I got a seven-year-old to keep me on my toes. That keeps you active for sure. And that fucking wears you the fuck out. I mean, so far, everybody I know has been, some of the relatives, not so much, but everybody I know has been okay. So, you know, I've known I'm people more who have contacted it. I, I've had some friends, two, a, a lady here, my daughter's godfather contacted it, an old dear friend of mine contacted it in Florida. So it lives. It's out there. Yeah. And everybody has a different story. You know? So yeah. that's where I stand, buddy. But I love you, dude. I want to see you. I love you, too, man. I'm doing a yeah. little yoga. I, I appreciate good. you doing that for the people. That's been a good. really good project of yours. We got behind it. 30 days of yoga. 30 classes are up there. I'll do I more. do a little yoga at the end of my workout. I've always been a big yoga dude, so I do some breathing. I do some downward dogs. There was a time you should have seen my downward dog. It was looked it like a it looked like a crippled <laughs> it looked like a crippled fucking duck. I could see with I your would, belly I would just like, be a, like shaking. a full and trying. My belly would be off. Now I go <laughs> from uh, I go from the cat pose. Mm -hmm. Right from there, I go into a downward dog, back into cat pose, breathe, look up, downward dog, hold it, go back. I do five of those. I'm tuned up. At the oh, end yeah. of my workout, a little meditation, 
take my shoes off, smell the feet. You it's know, good to breathe at the end of it too. Close just to your sit eyes. There without, yeah, just close your eyes and breathe. I do. Like, I do uh, a yama stay, and I also do a shavasana on my own. In the shade, I do a little shavasana to really so the, get the energy from the ground. I believe in it, and I'll tell you what, I've been making some great fucking notes for my upcoming audio book. A lot of shit has happened. I can't write a fucking joke. I tell you that much. Write about. There's nothing I to write about. I can't find a joke. There's nothing to write but about. But I've been making notes. I've I've been looking at my life from a different perspective. So I uh, found the silver lining in this. I'm yeah. not eating lobster tails. I'm not jumping up and down. I'm not in a surf boat. But I'm not out there with a cup with a dog either. So I feel what people are feeling through right now. And uh, I'm trying to help the best that I can, man. That's all I can tell you. But I love you, cocksucker. I love Give you, too. Give your family my Stay best. Alive, Liv. Yeah, yeah, they always Tell say hi to you. I they love, love you. My dad I loves love you. them, too. If they need any CBD, CBD Lion has them. I'm shipping right to your house. Really? Are they good still? They had some uh, Very good. spread and shit that was really good. Oh, yeah, no. He has tons oh. of that CBD Lion. Yeah, okay, good. That you, yeah. Oh, yeah. the fucking cream. I'm going to get some to Lee. I forgot to bring oh, it to The him. cream is the best. I gave it, it to right Jimmy Schubert. It so good. No, it's a gift. It heals? CBD Lion Cream is a fucking gift, my friend. Damn. It's a gift. It really is. I don't know what's in it. I don't want to know. I used to have spots on my legs. Yeah. And my legs always had dry skin. And I started putting it on after the shower. It feels like a baby's butt. It was I don't my have back. It was my eczema. back. And I do the yoga. And you spread it in there. And you're just like, it's not right away, but within like an hour, I don't like, know I'm what's feeling in it. better. I'm feeling better. I don't know what's in CBD Lion, the fucking ointment. Maybe it's heroin. Maybe but it's, I, I don't know it, what it is. And that tincture, when I have problems sleeping, the tincture yeah, is I never part tried of that. it. Oh, 5,000 really? milligrams of the tincture, and I'm good to go. No, it's not THC. Church for CBD line. I love you, Ari Shafia. <laughs> hey, Joey. I love you too, man. Take care of yourself and your family. Bye, Ari. <sighs> All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. That is the episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Joey Diaz, for tuning in. Guys, do not forget to check out The Church of What's Happening Now. Joey Diaz is fucking hilarious. You will love the stories. It's just all fucking this kind of shit. I can't believe he doesn't steal anymore. That's fucking nuts to me. No more Joey Diaz stealing. It's like, what? What's the world come to? Anyway, uh, thank you, Sheet.com, for sponsoring the episode. Um, go to Sheet.com. Use promo code Ari for 20% off your first order. Thank you for that chick for letting me fuck you with a fucking condom pulled out through a hole in an underwear. Daytime fuck. One of my first daytime fucks of all time. Ah, what makes a man? This is like the Nick Adams stories by Ernest Hemingway. So, that's the episode. Um, I'll leave a link to Acid Church if you want to get started with one of the fucking... How to uh, start with the Joey Diaz Church of What's Happening. Do Acid Church. It's not normal, but it's like I'm on it and we all took acid and fucking flipped out. So, it was fun. Me, him, Eddie Bravo. I think Duncan Trussell, but I also think maybe not Duncan Trussell. But in the two boxes, it'll be after this fucking episode. One will be Joy Diaz Acid Church, and the other one will be Mark Norman special, Out to Lunch. Make sure to see it. Mark Norman, great fucking joke writer. Um, free on YouTube. Did I say that? Oh, yeah, I must have. So that's the episode, you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I think I'm going to do a mailbag episode soon. Um, that's what I've been doing on Patreon, too. I think I'm going to do one on here. Maybe like a best of or something. Or I'll figure it out. I don't know. I really don't know. But if you want to support me, I appreciate it. If you go to patreon.com slash skeptic tank for five bucks a month, you can get a couple new episodes. It's pretty fucking good. It'll keep me in business. I have to pay for a studio that I'm not using for a year because they don't let you out of rents. In New York. Um, all right, guys, that's the episode. What else are we doing here? Oh, Shroomfest, I guess I got to tell you about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, guys, a lot of festivals have been canceled this year. You all know Bonnaroo, they're going to try to do it in September. Good luck. Good luck. Coachella, I think, September. Good luck. Shafir Fest, uh, whatever they're calling it, Skank Fest, maybe in September. Good luck. Who knows? But one festival is definitely not getting moved or canceled. Is Shroomfest. 
If you don't know what it is, it happens July 4th, 5th, and 6th this year. It coincides with the longest weekend of moonlight, weekend of the longest moonlight in the summertime, the Northern Hemisphere. And this weekend, this year, it's July 4th, 5th, and 6th. The way to participate is, wherever you are, you take some magic mushrooms, and then you eat those magic mushrooms. And then you've participated. That's all there is to it. Ooh, deer tracks. So I would get on your fucking drug dealers right now because there's going to be a run on them and people aren't going out. So they're not going to be able to replenish. If you don't know how to get them, I wrote a whole like how-to on, on mushrooms um, a long time ago. Really painstakingly. It's called Shroomfest Primer. Google it. Shroomfest Primer. You can find anything you need to about mushrooms. Uh, really, I, for your first time, I, I'm really suggesting reading that. I don't get anything off it. I fucking interview people. I really research. It's a good paper. It's how to do mushrooms. Everything, price, how they're going to hit you, how much to take. <sighs> the effects, the next day, all of it. But the, the, what you got to know is how to get them. It's not that easy to get. It's not like Coke. You do Coke, you're calling your drug dealer later that night. You get mushrooms, if you even do them right away, you're not calling your drug dealer for fucking a year. Unless you call them the next day and it's like, hey, I need more of those. Those are great mushrooms. So, Find your dirtiest friend or call your dirtiest friend. Say, hey, do you have any mushrooms? And if they say yes, great, you're done. If they say no, and ask them, like, how much of this, how many people? If they say no, it's like, do you know where I can get some mushrooms? And if they go no, then they like, push a little bit. If that doesn't work out, go to your second dirtiest friend and say, hey, I know fish is not touring now, so I need your help. Find me some mushrooms. Make it a competition between the two of them. Who can actually, who's your dirtiest friend? You, you, you're both in competition for being my dirtiest friend. Find me so I will pay for them. And July 4th, 5th, or 6th, or and if you want, take mushrooms and I'll meet you. It doesn't exist on this plane where there's a virus. It exists on another plane of the universe where there's no virus. It's all just trees breezing. Um, and that's it. Fucking, I don't know, clip this up and, and fucking send it to people. If you want, Shroomfest, July 4th, 5th, and 6th. So that's the episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Joy Diaz, for tuning in, for coming in. Um, I got nothing more to add, right? We're fucking done. I said the sponsor, sheath.com. Use promo code Ari, 20% first order. Patreon.com slash skeptic tank. That'll help me fucking be ad free, I guess, in the future. Yeah, once I get enough money, I'll just won't do ads. Um, the sheath guy's cool. He's like, say whatever you want. This will be a test of that. Um, talked about Shroomfest. Promoted Diaz and the Church of What's Happening Now. Mark Norman special. Crazy Yeti. I didn't really talk about him. He was a character. Fuck. I think he got caught for tax evasion. He did like, ah, fuck. I was going to talk about it, but maybe I shouldn't. I think he was, he, he, he ran like a, like a um, electronic store. Crazy Yeti is insane. He was, he was Israeli. And if you paid cash, you paid less. It was just known. That was just known. He had stores all over New York, and eventually they moved to fucking, they moved to, uh, down to Maryland, D.C., and I don't know where else. Crazy Eddie's insane. My presses are insane. I can't do accents at all. God. If you think I'm a bad comic, I think I'm bad at accents. So, like, I'm real bad at accents. Um... Anyway, the government was after him for something. I believe, unless I'm way wrong, he fled to um, Israel, right? Am I right, Israel? Netanyahu? Can you comment on that one way or the other? Bini? Bini? Bini, comment. Crazy Eddie. Is he insane? Not local, is it Mexicano? Crazy Eddie. He. Pushtak? No, uh, no, maybe. Eh, eh. That's what you do when you don't know someone's language. You just say, eh, eh, all right. You just like want to want to make it right, but you're like, I don't know the word. Fuck it. This is stupid. Um, or you're like, also subscribe to the YouTube channel. I have new fucking yogas coming out. I'm gonna try to do those two a week. Six and Jump, our podcast, it is now everywhere. You guys have got to download the Six and Jump podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, it's there. If it's not. Please tweet at Skeptic Tank Pod on Twitter or Skeptic Tank Pod on Instagram and, and, and uh, let Becky know that your fucking player doesn't have it and she'll try to add it to your player. Um, but Six and Jump is fucking great. It's me, Jay, and Dan. Me, Jay, and, and Dan Soder. Big Jay. 
and we're just fucking around. We watched 21 Jump Street. Legitimately, this is the podcast. We watched an episode of 21 Jump Street in order. We're going to do the whole series. And it's going to take two years. Come along for the ride. It's two years of fun. We watch an episode, and then we talk about that episode. So it's an hour of your time to watch the episode, 44 minutes. Everything, they're all on YouTube for free. And then two hours of us fucking shitting on it. It's so much fun. It's, my, it's what I'm lacking in this podcast, the morning zoo aspect. It's just us fucking around and just like tagging. Oh, I like this too. But th- I mean that, it's like they're two different things. Oh, it's fun. So tune into Six and Jump. Six, T-H, is it ampersand or and jump? I don't know. One of those two. Look for it. And it's on YouTube too. All the stuff's on YouTube. Full episodes. YouTube.com slash Skeptic Tank. Uh, so that's the fucker. Oh, so he ran to Israel. I think they might have deported him back or extradited him, whatever you want to fucking call it. I don't know. But they, he might have just died there. They might have just lived along the rest of his crazy life. What's Eddie in Hebrew? Eddie, Ed, 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 Edward, Ed? No, I don't think that's a biblical name. Um, guys, I don't think I got anything else to add. I think I'm just fucking wasting time at this point. So go home. Go home. Yeah, Are You Shafir Skeptic Tank? Oh, I didn't say the title in the beginning. Motherfucker. Are You Shafir Skeptic Tank, episode 386. The Revenge Robber. With Joey Diaz. Starts now. I actually did fuck that up. Now that I think about it, it wasn't starts now. It was the revenge robber with Joey Diaz. The revenge robber with Joey Diaz, over and out.